my entire body ached after a long day at work. I remember thinking how much I needed this vacation as I dragged my luggage up the steps of the rustic cabin nestled in the Appalachian Mountains. Hey, Andy! You're late! We have been waiting for you. My old college friend, Michael, hollered from inside. I chuckled while rubbing my sore shoulders, knowing full well that our yearly get-togethers were more about reminiscing and cracking jokes than punctuality. Traffic was a nightmare. I complained while crossing the threshold into the warm cabin. The smell of wood smoke filled my nostrils as I surveyed the familiar scene, a tradition that goes back well over fifteen years. The evening progressed with laughter and great conversation. Stories of our respective families and jobs flowed effortlessly around the cozy living room. Maria, another old friend, detailed her newest culinary adventures, claiming her latest creation, a triple chocolate arrow cake, to be out of this world. She playfully scolded me when I made an exaggerated moan about not having tasted it yet. None of us noticed how late it was until the sunlight faded into darkness outside the cabin windows. Michael suggested a walk to stretch our legs and get some fresh air, despite the crisp nighttime temperature. We bundled up in our winter gear and took off along a familiar path one we had enjoyed on countless previous occasions. As we walked through the moonlit woods with only our lamplights leading our way, little did we know that something otherworldly and ominous had different plans for us. The air grew colder, but there was warmth in our camaraderie. A twig snapped as if underfoot, and we all stopped in our tracks. What was that? Maria whispered nervously, probably a rabbit or deer getting away from these crazy people invading their home. Michael replied with a snicker, but he sounded uncertain, if not anxious himself. This unnerved me. Was our friend keeping something from us? We continued our walk, our confidences shaken, trying to hide the general unease from one another. Soon we stumbled upon an open clearing with a small creek flowing through it. Around the edge of the clearing were splashes of red, fresh blood. My heartbeat quickened, with whispers of fear taking hold in my chest. What happened here? I muttered under my breath. Michael leaned down to inspect it closely and then looked back up at us. Guys, let's go back. There's a chance that some animal is injured or killed around here. We don't need to get caught up in that. As if on cue, a low, guttural growl echoed through the forest. It sounded more like an animal that belonged in nightmares than in these woods. We exchanged anxious glances as primal fear gripped our very being. Michael grabbed both Maria and me by the arm practically dragging us back towards the cabin. The growling grew louder and intensified instead of fading into the distance as we hoped it would. Whoa! Maria cried out, stopping abruptly. She pointed at something moving behind a tree further away from us. A massive bipedal figure with canine features lurked in the shadows, its tall frame and muscular build unmistakably non-human. The entity let out another ear-piercing growl before lunging towards us with monstrous speed, a true embodiment of nightmare and dread coming alive right before our eyes. Michael's strong grip on Maria and me tightened as the monstrous creature advanced, its deep, growling breaths filling the silence of the night. I knew we couldn't outrun it, but we had to try. Despite the terror coursing through me, I realized that calling for help was out of the question. We were too deep in the wilderness, and any potential rescuers would only place themselves in harm's way. In a desperate sprint back towards the cabin, we stumbled over roots and rocks. 
The dogman werewolf hybrid creature followed close behind with a determined pace, as if merely toying with us. As we reached what appeared to be a dead end, I noticed some bear traps that were likely set up by hunters in the area. With no other options left, I quickly threw them towards the looming beast and watched as one firmly clamped onto its hind leg. A howl of pain and rage bellowed from its bloodied maw. We took this chance to rush back into the cabin, throwing every lock and barricading every window in a frenzy. The creature's furious snarls echoed outside as it attempted to break free from its metal bondage. Its frustration filled our ears until, suddenly, silence broke out. Michael, Maria, and I huddled together for what felt like hours as our hearts raced. Eventually, we heard distant murmurs outside, people approaching nervously while speaking in hushed voices. A knock came on our door, prompting us to hesitantly remove our makeshift barricade and peer through a sliver of space between the door and frame. Outside stood what appeared to be a group of hunters, wary but not aggressive. We just watched that thing retreat back into the woods, one hunter said cautiously upon noticing our frightened expressions. We're here to make sure you're okay. Gathering ourselves, we invited them inside to discuss what had just transpired. They introduced themselves and revealed their knowledge of local legends and cryptids, which they actively pursued during their hunting endeavors. According to them, the dogman werewolf creature we had encountered was notorious in the area, leaving a trail of both animal and human victims. They called this beast Kadi, and its origins seemed to be as elusive as the creature itself. We've hunted Kadi for months, one of the hunters admitted, looking defeated. But no matter what we do, it always seems to escape, adapting to our tactics each time. Realizing that our narrow escape from the clutches of Kadi was as much luck as it was skill, we decided to cut our vacation short and make a swift departure from the Appalachian Mountains. As Michael, Maria, and I made our way back to our respective hometowns, we couldn't shake the chilling memory of those bloodthirsty eyes or how easily Kadi had transformed our peaceful reunion into a night of terror. The story of our encounter with Kadi spread among friends and acquaintances, forever altering our view of the wider world, a world full of deadly creatures lurking just outside familiar territory. As for Kadi, the ruthless dogman werewolf remains elusive within the depths of these mountains, an ever-present reminder that in these mysterious forests where legends come to life, one can never be too vigilant or prepared for what nightmares lie in wait for unsuspecting visitors. There I was, sitting on the front porch of my humble abode in Louisville, Kentucky, whistling and indulging in my secret blend of ranch-flavored sunflower seeds. It was November 4, 2017, at precisely 3.32 p.m., and all around me, autumn was asserting its dominance with the vibrant hues of crispy leaves. My dog, Buster, lay beside me on the porch, wagging his tail every time someone walked by. Next to me was Bob, my chatterbox neighbor who never shied away from political discussions. He was going on and on about some conspiracy he had read about while getting his oil changed that morning. To be honest, most of it went in one ear and out the other. I didn't mind, though. His white noise was comforting in a way. Hey, man. I interrupted him as best as possible without seeming rude. Have you ever heard stories about a sort of dogman or werewolf around these parts? They say it roams the outskirts. Bob arched an eyebrow, pausing briefly to think. You know what? 
I have heard something about it. Some folks claim to have seen it along the outskirts of town near that abandoned farm. I shrugged it off as another local superstition that people just refused to let go of. But little did I know how everything would change for us soon. A couple of days later, we were walking through our local farmer's market when we stumbled upon a small area cordoned off by the police. Inhaling sharply at the gruesome sight before me, a mutilated fruit vendor's stand, I felt my gut twist uncomfortably. My first instinct was that this couldn't possibly be connected to those werewolf rumors, right? Bob leaned over to me solemnly and said, You don't think this could be that dogman thing? As if on cue, a blood-curdling howl pierced the bustling atmosphere of the market, leaving everyone stunned. Panic ensued, with people running in all directions to escape the threat they couldn't even see. It was chaos. Bob, Buster, and I somehow managed to stay together through the madness, finally catching our breath near a small park by the river. Bob's face was as pale as a sheet. Adrenaline pumping through my veins, I leaned against a tree and locked eyes with a trembling Buster, who suddenly started growling low in his throat. A drop of saliva hung from his jowls, as if he were staring down the most dangerous predator there ever was. My gaze followed where he was looking. My heart sank. Out from the tree lean emerged an enormous beast that defied logic, half man and half wolf. Its fur glistened with blood, and its eyes were wild like a rabid animal's. I raised my shaky hands in surrender so as not to threaten this horrifying creature when it lunged towards us. In an instant, Bob threw himself at it in some misguided attempt at heroism. The beast snarled, baring its blood-stained teeth, and lunged at Bob. It seemed like everything was happening in slow motion, the beast bearing down on him as streaks of crimson dripped from its maw. Just as it seemed to be too late for Bob, a shot rang out, piercing through the chaos. A park ranger appeared from behind a nearby tree, firing his rifle at the creature with practiced accuracy. The beast reeled back with a deafening howl, narrowly missing Bob before it retreated into the dense foliage. Buster barked ferociously after the retreating creature but the ranger shouted for him to stay back. What is that thing? I asked the ranger, my voice barely more than a whisper. He shook his head, looking uneasy. I've never seen anything like it before, he admitted. Stay away from the woods until we can get this situation under control. Bob looked at me, eyes wide with terror, muttering almost inaudibly. Looks like that legend isn't just a legend after all. We both knew it was more than just a rumor now. It was something real and terrifying, an actual monster haunting our town. Over the next few days, there were more reports of brutal attacks near the outskirts of town. The death toll rose quickly. People were being found mauled or torn apart in gruesome scenes that haunted even seasoned police and forensics professionals. Nobody goes outdoors alone anymore. A curfew was implemented to protect everyone from becoming victims themselves. I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched any time I had to step outside my house. Bob tried his best to learn more about our mystery assailant from online forums and old books. He discovered tales of an ancient and malevolent creature called Lugaru, a deadly werewolf-like entity that relentlessly hunted its prey until they met their gruesome end. As the attacks continued, it was clear that we couldn't handle this ourselves. I called the police and informed them that a group of us planned to track down this monster. More people, including some proficient hunters, joined our ranks in hopes of finally ending the nightmare. The following day, 
We ventured into the woods bearing our weapons, guns firmly in our hands, safety off. Every rustle of a bush or falling twig set Buster off into a frenzied state. Tensions were mounting, and it felt as if the creature could strike from any direction at any moment. Suddenly, there was an ear-splitting screech that sent terror down our spines. The creature had been cornered near an abandoned barn by some of the more experienced trackers in our group. It snarled and growled as it stared down its would-be captors, desperate, wounded, but still unquestionably dangerous. Bullets tore through the air as we fired upon the grotesque creature, aiming to wound but not kill it. Yet despite being shot multiple times, it fought back with unmatched ferocity, unwilling to go down without tearing into any one of us first. It was a battle unlike any other we had faced before, a dance with death itself. The beast trampled two brave souls under its massive paws before it fled deep into the woods, leaving behind a trail of blood and fear for us to follow. But we didn't continue to chase after it that day. Instead, we returned to our town to mourn our losses and plan for another showdown with this seemingly unstoppable entity. The eerie feeling that enveloped our town continued as stories of Lou Garou's encounters riddled newspapers and online forums. People whispered stories about its origins. Some claimed it was a vengeful spirit seeking revenge, while others believed it was an ancient demon unleashed by some horrific ritual. As days turned into weeks with no further sightings, an uneasy calm spread through the town. But we knew it wasn't over. Lugaru was out there, watching, waiting, and biding its time before it struck again. The evening was anything but calm as I stood outside my tent at Kings Canyon National Park, inhaling the cool night air that felt like needles on my skin. Frustration had settled in as we realized our loyal companion Neville's brand new camping stove gave off little more than a pitiful whimper. All of us, me, Neville, and my two best friends, Tracy and Michael, had finally managed to clear our hectic schedules to embark on a much-needed camping trip. We couldn't wait for an escape from everyday city life. I nudged Neville gently and muttered, For a man who claims to have mastered the art of cooking pancakes in the great outdoors, you'd think your stove would at least heat the damn pan. Neville chuckled sheepishly. Yeah, okay. I guess I was wrong about this one. The next day, after a much-deserved breakfast courtesy of Michael's reliable stove, Tracy suggested we go for a hike along the cliffs overlooking Kings River to take in some local history. The others agreed enthusiastically. I wasn't much of an enthusiastic hiker myself but decided to tag along regardless. It all went smoothly for the first mile or so, until suddenly, an unpleasant odor filled our nostrils like a dead skunk soaked in vinegar mixed with rotting flesh. We recoiled. There was something otherworldly about that stench. Our eyes watered as we attempted to breathe through our mouths instead. You think it could be the remains of some unfortunate wildlife? Michael asked hesitantly. Maybe, said Tracy grimacing and pressing her sleeve against her nose. We continued hiking cautiously when Tracy slipped on something wet and nearly lost her balance. On closer inspection, we saw thick red splatters smeared across the surrounding rocks. Panic washed over me like an icy current, and I instinctively thought someone was injured or worse. I think we should leave this place. I said, unable to shake off the disquieting feeling settling inside me like an unwelcome visitor. But Michael, always the stubborn and curious one among us, insisted that we follow the trail of unsettling red patches. 
As we ventured further into the woods, the crimson stains grew in size and frequency. Soon, we stumbled upon a grisly scene, human limbs protruding from a pile of rock and dirt. Close to it was a dark figure, tearing flesh, its face obscured by shadows. Run! Neville hissed urgently. As if on cue, we sprinted desperately back towards our campsite. The heavy breathing and dull ache in our legs were practically muted compared to the sounds, crunching bones and guttural rumbles, that echoed through our frantic haze. We barely made it back to camp before darkness enveloped us completely. Exhausted, our pounding hearts made a dread-filled soundtrack as we huddled together inside the tent. Tracy shivering uncontrollably as Michael took turns between whispering reassurances and casting anxious glances outside. What was that thing? She whispered through trembling lips. I don't know. Michael replied quietly. But I don't want it anywhere near us. Hours later, convinced the creature Hannon followed us back to our campsite, we took whatever little solace we could find in that waning hope. Our best course of action was quickly decided. Leave at first light. There was no time for retrieving any belongings left behind earlier in fear-stricken haste. As my eyelids grew heavier with impending sleep, a thought struck me suddenly. How did such a violent beast end up within this relatively well-populated area without anyone noticing? Gradually dawn broke through our desolate exhaustion. After hurriedly discussing plans for leaving, we didn't dare open our mouths unnecessarily lest the beast lurked nearby. Packing up proved relatively simple considering most of our gear had been abandoned hastily during the frightful encounter. Shadows retreated from daylight's advance when suddenly, wailing cries could be heard echoing ominously within the distance, prompting all four of us to halt our frantic packing in dread-filled silence. Ignoring the gnawing fear deep inside, I steeled myself as best I could before standing up and leaving my temporary haven to observe my surroundings. Neville, Tracy, and Michael did so similarly. We were still hesitant to open our mouths out of fear that whatever had let out those cries that haunted us throughout our packing remained near. Nearby, we noticed a man named Arthur, who lived just a few houses down from us. He gestured for us to come closer, and we hesitantly walked toward him. As we gathered around, Arthur whispered that he had discovered the source of the horrifying noises. The culprit was a person known as the Pain Artist. Arthur then explained that the Pain Artist was a disturbed individual who loved inflicting pain on both themselves and others. They would kidnap people from our neighborhood, bring them to an undisclosed location, and perform gruesome acts upon them while they were still alive. The pain screams we heard came from those unfortunates. Arthur had found out about the pain artist from a friend who worked in law enforcement and had been tracking them for months now. The police had tried to catch this sick individual, but with no success. Unfortunately, the friend was now among their latest victims. As we listened to the twisted story, we couldn't believe someone like that could exist in our community. None of us could imagine what those unfortunate victims must have gone through. We decided to cooperate with Arthur, providing him with any information or support he needed to apprehend the pain artists before they took another life or caused more pain and suffering. Night after night, our group ventured into various abandoned buildings and dark alleys, places where someone like the pain artist might hide searching for any clues or signs of their presence. The local police knew about our efforts but didn't discourage or interfere with us. They were just as desperate to find this monster. On the third night of our search, we finally stumbled upon something that would lead us straight to the pain artist, 
a fresh trail of blood leading down an alley and into an old warehouse. We contacted the authorities immediately, hoping that they could move quickly enough to stop whatever was happening inside. However, when law enforcement officers arrived and stormed into the warehouse, they found something that left them, and all of us, utterly stunned. The warehouse was filled with dozens of people, all frozen with fear and shock, staring at a gruesome scene. The pain artist was there, but dead, a bloody mess on the floor. Surrounding them were instruments of torture, some of which they had used on themselves in their final moments. Authorities took control of the situation and urged everyone to leave the premises. We understood that they needed to handle things from this point forward and thank them for their swift response. But as we exited the warehouse, I couldn't help but wonder how many lives had been ruined or lost due to that sick individual's twisted acts while they managed to avoid detection for so long. The devastating consequences of their atrocities will surely be felt throughout our community for years to come. And despite their deaths, we sadly realize that some wounds might never heal. They will always be a painful memory buried beneath the surface. With the end of the pain artist's reign of terror, we hoped things would slowly return to normal in our town. But deep down, we knew things would never be the same again. As we walked back home that night, the once comforting silence now felt eerie, as if hiding something sinister just waiting for an opportunity to strike again. My best friend, Tony, and I had been hiking the Appalachian Trail for a few weeks. Nothing beats fresh air and the freedom of exploring the great outdoors, except maybe pizza. A steaming hot slice of pepperoni pizza felt like a blessing after days of canned beans and protein bars. Anyway, we got to this really isolated area in Shenandoah National Park, Virginia. The sun was setting behind us, casting an orange haze over the entire valley. I scanned my surroundings and found a lone cabin a little way up from our campsite. Cool, right? After setting up the tents and getting a fire going, we decided to go check out the cabin. It was a simple structure covered in fading paint. Tony joked, Wanna crash here tonight? I shrugged. I wouldn't mind some walls between us and whatever creepy crawlies are out there. That night, we slept inside the cabin's musty interior instead of our tents. By morning, my allergies went wild. It definitely wasn't worth it. The day went by without any exciting or terrifying encounters. When we got settled around the campfire that evening, Tony's musings turned darker as he recounted, He's a sucker for creepy stories, local legends about some monstrous creature that lurked in these mountains, preying on lost hikers or something like that. Tony couldn't contain his laughter while I rolled my eyes. Come on, don't you think it would be exciting to run into something supernatural? He said between giggles. Yeah, you'd probably wet your pants, I countered sarcastically. The night was clear and stars filled the sky overhead. We settled in for another hour or two of swapping stories before nodding off. Suddenly, Tony perked up, his attention drawn toward the woods. We heard faint sounds of movement not too far away, maybe about 100 yards or so from our campsite. Some animal was sniffing around, I figured. As we quieted down to listen, the noise grew louder and more distinct. The hair on my neck stood up, and a chill ran through me. This was no ordinary animal. Suddenly, the firelight flickered, casting strange shadows around us. We both frantically grabbed our flashlights, scanning the area. A gut-turning stench filled the air. 
It was putrid, like decaying flesh that had been marinating in sewage for weeks. We caught sight of a truly nightmarish figure emerging from the darkness. This thing was tall, way taller than any human, and whatever it used to be, it wasn't human anymore. Its limbs were long and gaunt, with bones jutting out under its taut skin at unnatural angles. It moved in a predatory manner, perfectly blending its movements with the shadows around it. Tony whispered under his breath, Looks like I was right about the monster stories. I wanted to scream at him for spewing those tales earlier, but I couldn't so much as utter a squeak. My mind raced with thoughts as we stood there, frozen in pure terror. Why would this creature attack us? Did we stumble onto its territory? Or was it just hungry? Despite our petrification as witnesses to this nightmare of an attacker that appeared out of thin air itself, something primal kicked in. Fight or flight response. Whatever it was, it made us sprint till our legs threatened to give out, adrenaline coursing through us like electric shocks. With every footstep pounding against the ground beneath us and every frantic pant echoing inside our ears, we felt hot breath closing in on us from behind. That wretched stench of decay kept growing unbearable by each passing second. Seconds turned into minutes as we fled, our lungs burning with the exertion. The oppressive feeling of dread never disappeared, only increasing as the days crawled by. We knew we couldn't run forever. Our frail bodies could only endure so much. One evening, hiding behind a row of trash cans in an alleyway, I couldn't help but ponder the possibility of dying in this wretched manner. Abruptly, my friend Max spoke up, breaking the suffocating silence. I can't take this anymore, he blurted out breathlessly. We need to find a way to at least identify what's chasing us before it kills us. We don't have a choice. I admitted, despite my reluctance to say it aloud. We decided to reach out to our mutual friend Jen, who happened to be a forensic scientist working with the police force. We knew that she was involved in strange and unsolved cases sometimes. Jen met us in a dingy motel room we rented under an alias. Her face displayed both relief and fear when she saw us. She had heard about our plight through rumors. As we described the nightmarish creature that had been pursuing us, her eyes grew wide with horror. Hold on, she said abruptly, pulling out her phone and scrolling through some files. This matches the description of another case I've been working on, so far unsuccessfully. She showed us crime scene photos depicting an eviscerated victim who had suffered fatal injuries akin to those caused by some monstrous beast. In particular, one image showed claw marks that were alarmingly similar to those left on Tom's arm when he tried to fight off the creature a few days earlier. It connected the dots for Jen. Whatever pursued us was no ordinary predator. It was something far more sinister. But what could it be? As we sat there discussing theories and possibilities, we heard a faint noise outside the motel room. Before we could react, the door exploded inward, and there it was, the creature that had haunted our lives. Its twisted, grotesque form filled the entryway as its bloodshot eyes focused in on us. Jen's scream was all it took to jolt us back into action. We scrambled away from the creature, leaving it to maul an unfortunate passerby who'd been unlucky enough to walk past our room at that exact moment. Another wild chase ensued, yet this time we managed to record a quick video of our pursuer with Jen's phone. We were able to send it out to some contacts within Jen's circle who specialized in unexplained phenomena. Using the footage, they determined who or what had taken it upon itself to hunt us relentlessly. The antagonist turned out to be an ancient urban legend known only as a Keldama, 
a former outcast who had been viciously murdered and resurrected by dark forces unbeknownst to humankind. Left with an insatiable hunger for violence and chaos, Akeldama roamed the earth in search of vulnerable victims upon whom he could inflict his anger and torment. As the revelation hit us, I couldn't help but feel bitter about our predicament. We were innocent victims of fate in a twisted game played by unknown entities, paying the price for merely being humans. While we continued darting through alleyways and back roads in a desperate attempt to escape Akeldama's wrath, I knew deep down that our pursuer would never grow weary in his sadistic pursuit, nor would he ever be captured or killed by mere mortal hands. As I write this now, with my heart pounding against my ribcage and my fingertips trembling on each key press of this confession, I ask myself if we'll ever find freedom from this hellish nightmare or if we're doomed to meet our gruesome end in the grip of a Keldama's vengeful claws. The next moments remain uncertain, and cold dread grips me like a vice. But a part of me hopes this chilling tale serves as a reminder of the unnerving terrors that could lurk just beyond the periphery of your vision, or perhaps even closer. It was a sweltering afternoon in July, and I was visiting my cousin, who lived in a quaint small town just outside of New Orleans. I'm a freelance journalist by profession, and she has always regaled me with tales of this place and its colorful history. Figuring it was time to take a break from my busy life in the city, I decided to spend some time with her to see what all the fuss was about. As we were walking through the town square after lunch, I noticed a public announcement board plastered with various notices. One particularly caught my eye. It was a hastily scribbled warning about something lurking in the nearby swampland. The scrawled message read, Beware, creature sighted on Old Mill Road after dark. Stay away. The message seemed ridiculous eliciting chuckles from both of us as we continued our stroll around town. But as time went on and night began to fall, an inexplicable sensation of unease squirmed its way into my gut. Curiosity piqued. I coaxed my cousin into telling me more about this supposed ominous creature haunting the nearby swamps. She hesitated at first but eventually caved into telling me what she knew, or rather what rumors she had heard. It's said to resemble an abnormally large ape-like being, she whispered, her eyes darting around as though someone might hear her spilling these dark secrets. Some say they've seen it moving swiftly through the trees in the swampy areas outside of town. Noticing how sincere and slightly tense her voice sounded, I decided not to press her any further that night. The following day began like any other vacation day, lazy mornings filled with coffee and gossip, followed by explorations around town as we soaked in its rich history together. But as daylight began fading, my thoughts drifted back to that bizarre warning scrawled on the announcement board and my cousin's eerie whisperings about the twisted figure stalking the nearby swamp. Much to her dismay, I coaxed her into accompanying me to the edge of the swampland on Old Mill Road. As we stood on the gravel path, the knuckles of her grip turning white around an old wooden baseball bat she insisted on bringing, we gazed out into the murky wilderness that lay before us. We inched a few steps closer, both of our hearts pounding audibly in our chests. It was eerily quiet with only the rhythmic humming of insects chirping faintly in the distance. As we tiptoed even further into the shadowy depths of Old Mill Road, barely illuminated by a sliver of moonlight peeking occasionally through the dense foliage above, a growl made its way to our ears. To call it guttural would be an understatement, 
It felt like it shook our very bones as it reverberated through our veins, causing a nearly debilitating sense of dread to wash over me. I glanced at my cousin as though asking her permission to flee from this horrific symphony that was all too clearly not coming from any discernible source. Suddenly, out of the darkness lunged a figure beyond description, its tall silhouette towering over us. For a split second, I locked eyes, no gaze, with this monstrosity and felt myself spiral into an abyss of primal terror. Before we even had a chance to react, my cousin darted off towards town as though she could outrun this beast that had revealed itself so suddenly and savagely in front of us. With adrenaline coursing through my veins and trembling hands gripping my flashlight tightly like it was my only true possession in this world, I followed my cousin as she sprinted towards the town. Our feet pounded against the damp earth branches snapping under the weight of our hurried steps. The monstrous creature was right behind us, its sinister presence looming like a shadow we couldn't shake off. As we neared the edge of town, the beast's footsteps grew fainter until they disappeared altogether. My cousin and I burst into the safety of a well-lit street, breathless and disoriented. We didn't waste any time seeking help immediately running to the local police station to report our unnerving encounter with the mysterious creature. Soon after relaying our tale, a tall man entered the police station with dirt-covered clothes and a solemn expression. He introduced himself as Frank Foster, a Bigfoot researcher who had been tracking this particular creature for years. Frank joined us in the interrogation room and explained that this was not an isolated occurrence. He told us that multiple incidents involving this aggressive Bigfoot had taken place in our area recently. It's been attacking livestock and stealing from farms. We've even heard rumors of it hurting people, Frank said in an alarmed tone. We have to find it before anyone else gets hurt. He urged the officers as he shared his extensive knowledge on Bigfoot sightings and encounters. The police enlisted Frank's help in locating the creature, and together with several locals familiar with the forests surrounding our town, they formed a search party to hunt down whatever menace was lurking within. Not wanting to be involved in this potentially dangerous situation any longer than necessary, my cousin and I headed home to put as much distance between ourselves and that horrific night as possible. In the following days, we tried our best to return to some semblance of normality while keeping an ear on news updates about the search efforts for Bigfoot. Days turned into stressful weeks, but there were no significant breakthroughs in finding or capturing the creature. One evening... Frank knocked on our door to give us an update personally. We haven't caught it yet, but we've managed to severely limit its movement and force it further away from the town, he said. His eyes glistened with determination as he continued. I want you two to know that we're doing everything we can to catch this creature and keep everyone safe. We thanked Frank for his update and dedication but a lingering unease kept us awake each night, wondering if the monster would ever be caught. Weeks turned to months, and eventually, the story of our Bigfoot encounter was all but forgotten in the minds of most people. Life went on, but the shadow of that traumatic experience hung over our heads like a dark cloud. The creature remained elusive and at large, leaving the possibility of another dangerous encounter looming like a sinister specter over our lives. Years later, we still remember those chilling nights when terror gripped our small town. Although we never saw the creature again or heard any news regarding its capture or demise, we live with harrowing uncertainty. Somewhere out there in the vast expanse of wilderness lies the terrifying truth an unforgiving creature lurks just beyond our reach, leaving us wondering what might happen next.
bleary-eyed and nursing a mug of coffee, I sighed loudly into the cold night air, missing the days when I still had energy at this time of night. However, most people weren't excited about their careers as night watchmen at wind farms either. My modest life in the small town of Wasco, Oregon, seemed perfect until that fateful night, when everything changed. It was October 14, 2019, a Monday night that had seemed ordinary. I took a brief glance at my wristwatch. It was 2.16 a.m., almost halfway through my shift. My co-worker and friend, Tommy Evans, called on the radio to check in and add his usual humor to the shift. Hey, Mike, he said between chuckles. Why did the Scarecrow win an award? Because he was outstanding in his field. I groaned but found myself laughing anyway, maybe more out of exhaustion than anything else. In response to Tommy's bad puns and redemptive humor, I shared my progress over at Turbine 12. Our conversation continued as I made my way through a back dirt road to inspect another turbine when flashes of bright light caught my attention some distance away, as if from an approaching truck. Confused by their origins since no one else should have been out there, we reported this strange occurrence to our supervisor on duty. Just ignore it, he said, dismissing our concerns with a bored sigh over the radio probably some locals being idiots. Tommy and I didn't feel comfortable brushing this off so easily. We decided to split up and meet near where the lights seemed to originate from. As I cautiously approached my rendezvous point with Tommy, my flashlight flickered suddenly and without warning and died completely. Cursing my luck and trying not to let my uneasiness get the better of me, I continued forward only guided by the moonlight. My boots crunched the gravel loudly when a crunch came from another direction, a sound that definitely did not belong. Unable to see Tommy's face, I yelled in a whisper, Tommy, is that you? Surely it was my mind playing tricks on me. I could feel my heart racing, and every nerve seemed to be on alert. That's when I saw her, a figure not too far away from me, clad in ripped, dirty clothing, her hair tangled and matted as if she hadn't bathed in weeks. Worst of all were her eyes, intense and unnerving, they took you captive. She stared right back at me, no fear or hesitation on her face. Our eyes remained locked for what felt like an eternity as she approached me slowly. I reached for the radio at my hip to call Tommy for backup when the woman lunged towards me with her hands outstretched like claws. Alarmed and frightened, I grappled with her while trying to maintain some distance between us. My attention was focused exclusively on the woman when suddenly I heard a grunt come from behind me. It was Tommy. Though his help was desperately needed, I couldn't piece together what had happened or why he appeared so bloodied and battered. The woman between us grew even more frenzied and violent, but Tommy fought her off with energy that didn't seem possible given his state. Desperation drove our actions. We hardly noticed as the night twisted around us into a disturbing mix of shadows and mystery. With a final burst of strength, Tommy managed to push the woman away but managed to violently scratch my face in the process. Blood streamed down from the wounds as we stumbled back. I knew we had to retreat, regroup, and find help. Tommy, we need to get out of here. I yelled as we scrambled back to our vehicles in a blind panic. On our way into town, I called the emergency line but struggled to find the right words to describe what had just happened. They promised a team would immediately investigate and advised us to stay in our homes for safety. Despite our skepticism, we agreed that there were no other safe options. The next morning, 
a group of locals gathered at the diner to discuss the details of the bizarre incident. Tommy and I were bruised and battered but grateful to be alive. Rumors began circulating among the patrons about similar encounters over time. Other people had experiences with terrifying figures appearing from seemingly nowhere throughout Wasco. An older man named Jim approached us with knowledge of local lore he thought might help make sense of the situation. According to Jim, decades ago, there was a woman named Celia who lived alone on the outskirts of town with her only child, a daughter named Eva. Wanted by law enforcement for her part in horrendous crimes, Celia committed suicide before she could be captured. Distraught and overwhelmed with grief, Eva disappeared into the forest surrounding their home. It's believed she lived there until her mysterious demise. Many believe that Eva's restless spirit has taken on a monstrous form over time as Celia's dark past torments her sanity. This vengeful creature with distorted features would emerge from its home in nature, seeking vengeance on anyone who crossed its path, the fury of Wasco. Days passed since our encounter with this wretched being. Each day brought new reports of people seeing things lurking in the shadows or bearing strange scratches on their bodies. The town was in a state of fear and unrest even though many had yet to personally come face to face with the creature. It was eventually decided that, for everyone's safety, we could no longer work the night shift alone. There would be teams of at least three guarding the wind farm to prevent any further incidents. Tommy and I, along with a few other brave souls, agreed to soldier on and protect our town from this malevolent force. That following night was eerily quiet, seemingly safer than the events that had recently unfolded. We maintained radio contact with one another, but halfway through the shift, static filled our communication channel like a cacophony of demons. The shadows danced menacingly around us, as if signaling the impending approach of the fury of Wasco. Before we could react to this terrifying harbinger, the creature appeared right before our eyes, just as bloodied and malevolent as I remembered. Faster than we could have ever imagined, it began attacking us with its razor-sharp claws. We fought back as best as we could while remaining vigilant about calling for help over the constantly distorted radio signal. This time, however, we managed to keep the fury at bay long enough for local law enforcement officers to arrive on scene, guns drawn and ready for anything. Unfortunately, when they stormed towards where the fury had been standing only moments earlier, there was nothing left there, not even an indentation in the gravel where its feet had been planted. The only evidence this horrific entity left behind were the fresh gouged marks in the skin of its desperate victims. The town would continue living under an ominous shadow cast by a force none of them could fully understand or overcome. Their current safety was nothing more than a temporary moment salvaged from a hard-fought battle that would likely rage on indefinitely. What ultimately happened to the fury of Wasco remains uncertain. But one thing is for sure, you can never truly escape evil. It only waits in the shadows, biding its time for the next opportunity to strike. It was the fall of 2001, and I had just started working as a park ranger in the Ozark Mountains. To be honest, I took the job because I liked the idea of spending my days outdoors, enjoying the peaceful serenity of nature. The first couple of months went by without a hitch. That is, until October 13th. I remember that day clearly, as it's when my life changed forever. The morning started off rather routinely. 
My supervisor handed me a list of areas to patrol within the park and reminded me to maintain communication via the walkie-talkie. Since it was Saturday, a busy day for campers and hikers, I anticipated nothing more than reminding people about fire safety rules or keeping their dogs on leashes. As the afternoon rolled on, I arrived at an overlook called Whispering Pines. The view from up there was stunning. Below me, stretched miles of dense forests splashed with vibrant fall colors. While gazing out into the distance, my eyes happened to catch an odd sight. What appeared to be something red dotting a thick tangle of undergrowth about twenty yards away. Concerned that it might be an injured camper or hiker, or worse, evidence of foul play, I swiftly made my way off trail toward the spot where I saw the unusual color. As I drew closer, I began to realize that it wasn't something natural at all. It was instead a man-made object, dozens of voodoo dolls nailed to trees surrounding a small clearing in the woods. The red color that initially caught my attention turned out to be bright crimson thread crudely sewn into each doll's eyes and mouth. I reached out and touched one hesitantly, feeling chilled by how they'd been treated so maliciously, with sharp objects driven into their tiny forms. Hey! What are you doing? came a gruff voice from behind me. Startled, I turned around to see an old man with unkempt white hair and a grizzled beard. His eyes were filled with suspicion as he studied me up and down. Uh, sorry, I am a park ranger here, just checking up on this place. Who are you? I stammered, trying to keep my tone even. The old man sighed wearily and introduced himself as Eustace a local hermit living on the fringes of the national park. He proceeded to tell me that the dolls were said to protect the land from an ancient evil known as the Ghoul of Whispering Pines, a terrifying creature that fed upon human flesh and had its lair somewhere deep within this very forest. It seemed like a rehearsed spiel crafted to scare away curious outsiders but something in his voice hinted at sincerity. I'd really appreciate it if you could just leave those dolls alone. Eustace barked emphatically as he peered anxiously into the woods behind me. They're all that's keeping us safe. Not wanting to incite further conflict, I decided to let go of the matter after snapping some photos from my superiors. We exchanged a few final words before I left to finish up my patrol. Hours later, as darkness settled over the mountains, I found myself returning repeatedly to thoughts of those unnerving dolls and their grisly purpose. Although I fully intended not to venture back into that part of the forest on my own accord or suggest others do so until it was properly investigated, such intentions went unfulfilled once the chatter on my walkie-talkie sent me crashing back into reality. Someone was screaming for help near Whispering Pines, and given how close I still was, there wasn't time to wait for backup. Racing towards their cries despite the risks involved caused me to have conflicting feelings. I bolted through the woods, following the screams that pierced the air. Vibrations from the yells transmitted into my walkie-talkie, reinforcing the urgency of each step. The forest made it difficult to pinpoint an exact location, but I eventually came across disturbing evidence of a struggle, shredded clothing splattered with blood and disturbed foliage all around. My heart raced as I considered the possibility of an animal attack. The screams grew louder as I stumbled upon the source. A group of hikers huddled together beneath a tree, shaking with terror as they stared off into the distance. Cautiously, I approached them while reaching for my walkie-talkie to alert colleagues of their discovery. But before I could initiate communication, one of the hikers stopped me. No time! He choked out through panicked breaths. 
It's coming back. Their eyes widened in horror as more crashing noises resounded in the darkness around us. Not knowing what we might encounter but determined to help them no matter what, I guided them away from their original location and deeper into the woods with haste. Along our escape route, we heard snarls and snapping branches close by. Adrenaline-driven fear propelled us forward as though our very lives depended on it. We continued until we found refuge in a cave just off the main trail, a temporary safe haven that allowed us to catch our breath and regroup. With great difficulty, one hiker managed to describe what had attacked her group, an enormous beast covered in matted black fur that seemed almost impervious to injury. It had torn apart their campsite and injured several members before retreating back into the forest. I realized then that I couldn't call for help. We needed to leave without attracting further attention from whatever it was that hunted us. Any loud noise could potentially summon our tormentor. Under cover of darkness, we moved stealthily towards the park entrance. It felt like our predator watched us, lurking just out of our sight. All the same, our slow and cautious advance ensured that we successfully covered most of the distance without incident. However, relief faded quickly once we heard it, a blood-curdling growl echoing throughout the forest. We broke into a frenzied sprint. Whatever small advantage we'd held before had vanished in an instant as the creature's hot breath closed in on us. As luck would have it, we reached a section of trail that let me hatch a last-minute plan to deter our pursuer. I instructed the hikers to split up at a junction and meet back at the ranger's station, hoping that confusion would allow us the vital moments needed to put extra distance between us and the monster. After what felt like hours of desperate running, during which time the creature's eerie wails accompanied our passage, each of us arrived individually at the safe embrace of the station's shelter. United again in relief, we shared our gratitude over having narrowly escaped certain death. Eustace entered then, haggard and pale after being alerted to what had transpired. It is as I feared, he said mournfully. Without those dolls in place, nothing stands between us and that beast. His face contorted into one of deep grief as he continued. The ghoul of whispering pines hungers once more. Shaken by tonight's violence beyond all comprehension, I could do little more than nod my agreement with his claim. Dread descending upon all those who had borne witness to such malevolence, as darkness continued its creeping consumption of light beyond our sanctuary's doors. February 15, 2016 started like any other ordinary day for me. I was a graduate student living in a small apartment in Boston, Massachusetts, while pursuing my master's degree. I spent most of the day in the library, working through my never-ending pile of books and articles I had to read. It didn't help that I was kind of a procrastinator by nature. When I got home that evening, exhausted from my studies, I decided to order some Chinese takeout and watch a few episodes of my favorite sitcom to unwind. As I snuggled on the couch with my food, laughing at witty quips from the show, the phone rang. Much to my annoyance, my friend, who usually had a nose for sniffing out spoilers, began gloating about an upcoming twist in one of our favorite TV series. Remember that guy from season three who was dating the main character? Apparently, he's back, but he's not who we think he is, she exclaimed excitedly. Remember what we discussed before? No spoilers. Talk to you tomorrow, I said, and I hung up. 
After finishing my meal and a couple more episodes of the show, I noticed it was already past midnight. Exhausted, I tidied up the living room and headed toward the bedroom. Just as I was about to turn off all the lights and call it a night, I heard a faint sound coming from outside. It sounded like someone shuffling through dry leaves or rustling plastic bags. Rolling my eyes, assuming it was probably one of those overly curious raccoons that frequented our street trash cans, I ignored it. But then something caught my eye, an unusual movement outside my window. It seemed like someone was standing on the sidewalk across the street and staring directly into my bedroom. I couldn't see their faces very well because the streetlight wasn't close enough to illuminate them fully. It appeared as if they were wearing a hoodie and had one hand partially raised, as though they were waving or maybe gesturing for me to go outside. My heart pounded in my chest as I considered my options. Part of me thought of calling the police. But then I wondered if it was just some high school kid engaged in harmless neighborhood shenanigans. Ultimately, I decided to take a deep breath and muster up some courage. Hey, what do you want? I shouted through the cracked window. The figure didn't respond. It stood there for a few more seconds before suddenly sprinting down the street and disappearing into the darkness. The whole episode left me deeply unsettled, so I made sure all doors and windows were locked before forcing myself to go to bed. A week went by without any further incidents, allowing me to almost forget about the hooded figure. But late one night, after another study marathon at the library, my world was flipped upside down. As I entered my apartment, Everything seemed normal at first glance. However, upon taking a few steps inside, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. The air felt heavy with an unexplainable tension. Though nothing in the living room seemed out of place, I hesitated while reaching for the light switch. Surely nothing would jump out at me if I flipped it on. Trying to shake off my paranoia, I reminded myself that, more than likely, stress from grad school was doing a number on my nerves. I continued with my routine for the next few days, my mind preoccupied by the strange occurrences I had experienced. Every time I walked around my neighborhood, I couldn't help but feel like someone was watching me from a distance. This lingering unease prevented me from focusing on my studies and caused me to become increasingly paranoid. One afternoon, I decided to take a break and meet up with a close friend at a local cafe. Over coffee, I hesitantly shared my recent experiences involving the hooded figure and the eerie sensation of being watched. My friend listened intently before suggesting that we make an appointment with someone they knew who specialized in personal security consulting. Two days later, we met with this consultant, whose name was Davis. He was a former law enforcement officer with years of experience, and his observation skills were nothing short of impressive. After hearing my story, he agreed to help me investigate my concerns by installing hidden security cameras around my apartment. The very next night, I received a frantic call from Davis. He urged me to leave my apartment immediately and go to the nearest police station, as he was on his way there as well. I quickly grabbed my things, locked up, and drove to meet him. When I arrived at the station, Davis was waiting for me with a grim expression on his face. He handed me his phone and started playing footage from the security cameras. Throughout the day while I was away, a hooded figure had been breaking into my apartment and searching through all of my belongings without leaving any trace of forced entry. Davis had managed to enhance one frame where the intruder's face was visible 
It was the same person who had appeared outside of my apartment that late at night weeks ago. The police offered assistance in trying to identify this individual and protecting me until their identity could be discovered. One officer mentioned that there had been a string of disappearances recently in neighborhoods nearby ours, but they had not found any concrete leads yet. He suggested the hooded figure might be connected to these cases. I was horrified and stayed with friends for the next several days while the authorities conducted their investigation. Meanwhile, Davis continued to monitor my apartment, keeping me updated with anything that might help identify the hooded figure. Finally, one evening, Davis contacted me with news he'd received from a former colleague who had recognized the hooded figure when reviewing security footage in another neighborhood. He shared that this individual was known as the follower among law enforcement due to his ability to blend in with his surroundings and stalk his victims without being detected. It has been discovered that the follower had developed an unsettling motive. He derived pleasure from instilling fear in his victims before ultimately abducting them. Miraculously, Davis's swift action in urging me to go to the police station potentially saved my life from the follower's twisted intentions. Although I felt grateful for having escaped the follower's dangerous grasp, I couldn't help but shudder at the thought of how close I'd come to being one of his victims. The police continued their efforts to track him down and apprehend him, but were unfortunately unsuccessful. The follower remained elusive and at large, leaving me with no choice but to move to a different city and start a new life under significantly heightened personal security measures. Though I managed to escape the follower's sinister clutches, I'm haunted by the horrifying knowledge that he's still out there somewhere, stalking other unsuspecting victims and instilling deep-seated fear within them before making his sadistic move. As I adapt to my new reality, I can't help but wonder if they will be as fortunate as I was in escaping this nightmarish specter. I've always had an inexplicable fascination with unexplored territories. So, when my friend Caspin Thorne invited me to accompany him on a camping trip to the dense wilderness of Nebraska's Pine Ridge Reservation, I eagerly accepted. There was just something about that place that seemed to call out to me. We arrived at a remote campsite near the town of Chadron on June 19th at around 4.30 in the afternoon. Caspin and his cousin, Ravenna Dahlstrom, wasted no time in setting up camp while I began unpacking our limited provisions. As evening approached and darkness fell, we sat around the campfire, sharing tales of past adventures and laughing at our follies. Little did we know that our light-hearted camaraderie would soon be shattered by an encounter with something straight from our darkest nightmares. Three hours into nightfall, we heard it, a sudden, piercing scream echoing through the woods. It sounded terrifyingly close, unlike anything any of us had ever heard. As an avid outdoorsman, I was familiar with many animal noises, but this one eluded me. We immediately dropped our conversation and exchanged nervous glances. That sounded like someone being gutted alive, Ravenna said nervously. Caspin tried to comfort her, saying it might have just been some strange animal or a hunter's gunshot echoing through the trees. An unsettling tension settled upon the group as we decided it was best to extinguish our fire and hunker down inside Caspian's large tent. As I lay in my sleeping bag, thoughts of strange creatures creeping through the shadows kept me awake. Sleep finally came fitfully to me as exhaustion took over. I awoke just past midnight to the sound of scratches against fabric, the tent wall nearest my head. 
Startled and with my heart pounding, I reached for my flashlight with trembling hands and shone it out towards the area of disturbance. The scuffling stopped abruptly. My curiosity got the better of me, and I decided against my own instincts to step outside the tent. What met my eyes was a gruesome scene in the pale moonlight, deer carcasses, limbs twisted and torn, and entrails strewn about in a macabre artwork of gore and death. It was as if something had brutally hunted and mutilated these innocent creatures with untamed savagery. Caspin and Ravenna were awakened by my gasp of terror, stepping out of the tent with equal shock upon viewing the carnage before us. The air seemed charged with an oppressive, malevolent energy. We knew we had to leave. As we frantically packed our belongings, Caspin spotted a figure near the tree line, tall, lanky, with elongated limbs and a hunched gait. Its sunken, intelligent eyes bore into ours as it swiftly vanished into the darkness. We left everything behind as we fled back to civilization plagued by thoughts of what we had encountered. Days later, while discussing the event with Chardon locals, we discovered rumors of the Pgazanka, an ancient Arapaho legend that allegedly haunted those very woods for centuries past. That malevolent being still haunts my dreams as I relive our horrifying brush with terror on that fateful night at Pine Ridge Reservation. Some things are better left undiscovered, and some secrets remain shrouded in shadow for good reason. Escaping that place felt like a stroke of luck, but life has never quite returned to normal since then. In the days following our disastrous camping trip, I couldn't shake the eerie feeling gnawing at my insides. This both intrigued and terrified me to the point of obsession. Caspian, Ravenna, and I decided to seek out more information about the Pgazanka, hoping that gaining knowledge might alleviate some of our fears. On June twenty-second, at approximately 9 a.m., we visited Chadron's Historical Society, searching through old newspaper articles and town records. We stumbled upon several accounts of strange occurrences over the centuries on the Pine Ridge Reservation. One particular entry from a journal dating back to 1897 described an uncanny creature with similar features to the one we had witnessed, tall, lanky limbs, sunken eyes, and a hunched gait. In the evening, around 7 p.m., we contacted Dr. Wendell Lorrington, a renowned anthropologist specializing in Arapaho mythology. He agreed to meet us for dinner to discuss our experiences and review his own encounters with the Pgazanka legend. Dr. Lorrington shared stories of isolated incidents throughout history, victims found torn apart, their remains scattered across the forest floor. He described an encounter from six months earlier, when two hunters reported finding another mutilated deer not far from where we had camped. After several hours of discussion over dinner, Dr. Lorrington hypothesized that it must have been this elusive creature we had come face to face with. As irrational as it seemed to me at first, his hypothesis was too detailed to be pure imagination. One comment stuck with me as we said our goodbyes on June 23rd at 11.30 p.m. The Pingazanka may appear as a fearsome beast, but ancient Arapaho stories tell of its ability to take any form it desires. Some legends even suggest it can mimic the voices and mannerisms of its victims. The following day, June 24th, at around 10 a.m., Caspin and I returned to the campsite, armed with road flares, pepper spray, and hunting knives, driven by an unspoken desire to confront the creature we had hoped to forget. We arrived by noon and were horrified to discover the fresh remnants of another slain deer. The putrid stench of death that hung in the air was nauseating. At roughly 2.30 p.m., 
we noticed unnatural sounds coming from deep within the woods, as if the trees themselves were groaning in pain. Driven by adrenaline, excitement, and dread, we ventured further into the darkened forest, our direction guided only by these unnerving cries. We eventually stumbled upon a clearing at around 4 p.m., illuminated by the sunlight, where a disfigured figure crouched over yet another victim, this time a young woman who appeared lifeless. Her eyes were wide open in terror, her clothes were torn and bloodied. Upon spotting us, the Pingazanka snarled with rage, its sunken eyes glaring at us. In that moment, we didn't have time for rituals or nonsense. We knew we had to act fast, using our primitive weapons for defense. Caspin ignited one of our road flares while I brandished my hunting knife beside him. Seemingly intimidated by the flare's blaze or perhaps sensing our unwavering determination to protect what remained of our sanity, the Pingazanka retreated to the darkness of the trees with menacing agility. Unsettling as it was to realize we likely hadn't seen the last of this creature, we couldn't leave the girl's body abandoned in these sinister woods. The remaining daylight hours were spent carefully carrying her corpse back to civilization, a chilling reminder of the grisly reality left in the wake of our encounter with the Pingazanka. It was about three weeks after I settled into my new place, located in Amherst, Massachusetts, when I started to notice something off about the area. It was the middle of February, and I had recently moved in after accepting a job as a teacher at a local high school. The academic year would be starting soon, and I thought the fresh start would do me some good. Everything seemed perfect at first. The house was cozy, the neighbors seemed friendly enough, and the town had a quiet serenity that I found both peaceful and comforting. The only downside was the terrible commute. Regardless of the route I took, it always ended up taking far longer than expected. But it was worth it, or so I thought initially. One peculiar evening, after returning home from yet another grueling day at work, I ran into my next-door neighbor, Tom, a stocky older gentleman with glasses that almost swallowed his face who was well-versed in local tales. We'd often run into each other while walking our dogs and engage in lengthy conversations about anything and everything. During one of these exchanges, Tom brought up a legend about strange happenings around town related to a creature called a skinwalker something that I'd never heard of before. Apparently, this legend is native to certain tribes in the southwest region of the country but somehow made its way here over time. Tom proceeded to tell me that every decade or so, gruesome incidents occurred around Amherst. In this decade, he said there had been sightings of some sort of humanoid figure with elongated limbs lurking in shadows near the edge of the woods out by Ripon Hill Road, which happened to be right where my new workplace was located. Feeling skeptical but genuinely intrigued nonetheless, Tom's words stuck with me as I continued my days in Amherst. Little did I know just how soon those words would take on a new, sinister meaning. As the nights got longer and colder, I began to see it too. The ambiguous shape had an eerie air about it that made you feel as if your worst nightmare was staring back at you from the darkness. The figure seemed to stalk me as I drove home at night, appearing just beyond the reach of my headlights. At some point, paranoia turned into insistence that whatever was lurking on the side of the road was more than just my imagination. And then, one night, after having dinner with colleagues at the Hangar Pub and Grill on University Drive, I took a shortcut back home through Pine Street Woods near Ripon Hill Road, turning onto a narrow dirt path that wound through the darkening woods, 
My headlights cast eerie shadows into the fog-drenched trees. I saw it again, that unsettling humanoid figure standing motionlessly by the tree line. Grabbing my phone, I snapped a picture of the dark figure silhouetted against the fog before getting out of my car and calling out. No response came other than a sudden feeling of dread washing over me, as though I had intruded upon some ancient secret. Suddenly, remembering Tom's tales, a shiver ran down my spine as fear took hold. The creature suddenly let out an inhuman shriek that resonated throughout the gloom-shrouded forest. It sprinted off clumsily but somehow with terrifying speed and agility into the darkness beyond. Knowing that I couldn't possibly outrun or fight whatever had assaulted my senses in those woods, I jumped back in my car and sped away from what seemed like certain death. Since that night's encounter, Insomnia has taken hold of me like some ghastly specter, sapping away all hope of ever feeling normal again. I can feel its presence reaching for me from somewhere within those cursed trees, hunting me relentlessly as prey for purposes unknown. Unable to find solace in either sleep or waking hours, I can see no escape from its unyielding grasp. I now know it to be the skinwalker of which Tom foretold, a creature of unmatched malevolence that feeds on terror and despair. As I sit here, writing this with trembling hands, the knowledge that it will come for me again fills me with an unbearable dread that threatens to overpower every fiber of my being. My time is running out, that much is certain. My heart pounded in my chest as I frantically locked all the doors and windows of my house. Night had fallen, and the feeling of impending doom was inescapable. Even though I couldn't see any sign of the skinwalker outside, I knew it was only a matter of time before it came for me again. It was 11.07 p.m. when my phone rang, startling me out of my anxious stupor. With shaking hands, I answered the call. It was a local number, but one I didn't recognize. Hello? I managed to stammer. Hey, uh, is this Jason? The gruff voice on the other end queried. Yeah, who is this? My name's Ed. Tom told me to give you a call. The mention of Tom's name sent a shiver down my spine. Ed continued explaining that Tom had told him about my encounter with the skinwalker and that he might be able to help. Ed began to relay his own experience from two years ago, when he stumbled upon Bigfoot while out hunting in the same cursed woods where I had run into the skinwalker. He told me about how the beast had followed him home, leaving disturbing mementos and scrawled messages that only intensified his fear. The only way I got it to stop bothering me, Ed said in a hushed tone, was by making an offering. It was one part superstition and one part desperation. He detailed placing an offering of raw meat on his doorstep and retreated into his house with bated breath. To his surprise, Bigfoot did not return after taking the offering. What if it doesn't work? What if it comes back? I asked in panic. It might not work, Ed admitted, but it's all we've got. I thanked him for sharing his story and hung up, filled with an uneasy mixture of hope and trepidation. With nothing left to lose, I went into the kitchen and grabbed a package of raw meat from the fridge. I ventured outside, placing it hesitantly by the front door. The clock ticked away my eyes glued to my security cameras as the moon sank lower in the sky. Minute by agonizing minute, I waited for something, anything, to happen. As 3 a.m. approached, I could barely stand it any longer. But then, at precisely 3.07 a.m., every hair on my body stood on end as I watched the screen. With unnatural speed and fluidity, the shadowy form of the skinwalker materialized on camera. It approached cautiously, 
snatching up the offering before slipping away into the darkness once more. The following day passed sluggishly as I spent each waking moment dreading the evening's arrival. But when night fell, there was no sign of the creature's return. Even more strangely, it was as if some unspoken agreement had formed between me and this monstrous being. Every night thereafter, I repeated my offering to the skinwalker, and every night at 3.07 a.m., it would appear to accept its due before disappearing back into the void from whence it had come. With each passing day, I found myself gaining back a modicum of normalcy in my life. No longer did I live in constant terror that death waited around every corner. However, deep down inside me, a lingering unease stirred. Despite its eerie predictability, the skinwalker remained an unpredictable entity that continued to haunt me even when I was absent. Though I was now able to sleep through most nights thanks to our unspoken truce, I couldn't shake that nagging feeling that one day the wanderer just might come for something other than its offering. And then what? My morning routine was interrupted by a knock on the door. I rarely get visitors, especially this early in the day, and I don't precisely recall the specific date that it happened. Reluctantly, I opened it to find a young woman, a neighbor of mine, who asked if I had seen her dog since last night. Her hands were shaking slightly, and she explained that she had spent all night searching for her pet. I told her I hadn't seen anything but would keep an eye out. Then, she gratefully departed. Days turned into weeks without any sign of the missing dog. Despite being skeptical about the entire situation, several neighbors started sharing their stories about strange occurrences they had been noticing lately. Late-night howls and yelps echoing through the woods behind our homes were among the top concerns. One evening... After work, I decided to take a walk through those woods to clear my head. The sun was setting amidst a tapestry of purples and oranges when something caught my eye, a mangled mess of fur lying on the ground. Upon closer inspection, I recognized it as my neighbor's missing dog. It lay decimated, its limbs ravaged and twisted unnaturally, and claw marks covered its lifeless body. I felt sick to my stomach as unease crept over me. When another neighbor's cat disappeared a few weeks later in similar circumstances, we couldn't ignore it any longer. The community began nightly patrols around the neighborhood without much success. One damp and cloudy night during my shift on patrol duty with a fellow skeptic named Larry, we heard crashing sounds in the foliage just ahead of us. We decided to investigate cautiously. We spotted a colossal figure shrouded in darkness. As we squinted alongside our dim flashlight beams, trying to make sense of what was before us, it lunged at us with supernatural speed. Over seven feet tall with elongated limbs, this ferocious beast resembled nothing we had ever seen before. Covered in coarse fur, with a wolf-like head and razor-sharp claws, it snarled at us, saliva dripping from its blood-stained maw. Terrified, we turned to flee from the monster as it landed a blow, paying little regard to our panic-stricken state. It effortlessly knocked Larry away several feet, landing in the underbrush with a bone-crunching thud. I stumbled over roots and muddy ground as adrenaline pumped through my veins, Panic took its toll on my senses as pain erupted in my side when I tripped over something hidden beneath the leaf litter. The creature circled around me, lunging suddenly and ripping into my left arm with its gnashing teeth. Blood seeped into the soil, staining it as I howled with agony. I knew I was about to meet my end. Suddenly there was an ear-shattering crash of branches and foliage behind the creature. 
unsure if some mysterious hunter or something even more sinister was entering the fray. We both froze for a moment, allowing me a brief respite. The immense, shadowy figure whipped its head around to face the unknown source of disturbance before clambering into the thick underbrush at an alarming speed without making another sound. Wounded and shell-shocked, I crawled towards Larry and found him bruised but breathing. We managed to support each other back to a nearby house to call for help. Our encounter was not well received by local authorities. They skeptically praised us for our story, but suggested we may have met an escaped convict or perhaps another angry neighbor who had taken matters into their own hands. The incident with the creature left me with a relentless sense of dread that persisted throughout the following days. With Larry and I having barely managed to escape our encounter with the monstrous creature, fear took a firm grip on our neighborhood. In the wake of our horrifying experience, people became increasingly paranoid and desperate for answers. Late-night conversations among neighbors led to wild speculations about the identity of the beast we had encountered in the woods. Noticing how my own traumatic experience was affecting my community, I decided it was time to seek out help from someone knowledgeable about wildlife and local legends. After making some phone calls, I eventually got in touch with Dr. Susan Burke, a renowned expert in tracking and identifying obscure animal species. I met with Dr. Burke one cold morning at a nearby diner to discuss my recent encounter with the wolf-like creature. She listened intently as I described in detail my harrowing encounter and the state of the mutilated pets found amidst the woods. One thing is certain, this is no ordinary animal, she said sternly after taking a moment to digest my story. The way it attacked you, you were lucky to escape alive. But it got frightened by something, which is strange. Animals like these are fearless when cornered. I know, I quietly responded, still shaken by what had happened on that fateful day. Do you have any idea as to what could have caused such an animal to suddenly freeze and retreat like that? Dr. Burke pondered for a moment before saying, It's unclear at this point. There may be another predator in the area that could have caused fear or extreme caution, something we don't yet understand. She then motioned for us to leave the diner, suggesting we visit the site where Larry and I had our close call. Upon arriving at the site of our battle against the beast, Dr. Burke conducted a thorough examination of both its claw marks and paw prints. As she analyzed the evidence before her, her face contorted into an expression of puzzlement. I've never seen anything like this, she admitted with a stunned look on her face. The prints and the marks on the ground, these are unlike any known animal. In that moment, the sound of rustling bushes sent a chill down my spine, causing me to freeze in terror. Dr. Burke instinctively grabbed my arm and whispered, Quick, we need to get out of here. It knows we're here. As we attempted to leave the scene, we stumbled upon a man sporting a bloody jacket who appeared on the edge of consciousness as he leaned against a weathered tree. Dr. Burke grabbed her medical supplies from the car and began administering first aid while I dialed for paramedics. W. What happened? He stammered through gritted teeth as he clung to life before passing out. The brave stranger had ventured deep into the woods in search of the creature that had been terrorizing our community. He now paid the price for underestimating its ferocity. In the days that followed, our town prepared for an inevitable showdown against the monstrous beast. Dr. Burke enlisted local wildlife experts and hunters to track down and hopefully drive away whatever remained lurking in our woods. One evening, as residents nervously guarded their homes while an armed team pursued the creature, a deafening howl echoed throughout the darkness, 
signifying another life claimed by this nightmarish menace. Fed up with this reign of terror following our losses, I galvanized my fellow neighbors to devise traps and other countermeasures designed to ward off this relentless predator. The successive confrontations were tense and brutal, but ultimately drove off the terrifying monster from our midst. We were left with scars that would never heal, both physical and emotional, but ultimately emerged victorious against something beyond understanding. As life slowly returned to our once peaceful community, we knew the creature would forever haunt our dreams. No longer plagued by deadly nocturnal terror, we had proved our resilience and banded together in the face of pure horror. From that day on, our neighborhood stood united as one, knowing that although the creature may still lurk beyond the shadows of the world, it would never again succeed in tearing us apart. I often think back to that late September afternoon in 2005 when life as I knew it took an unforeseen and chilling turn. My role as a CIA operative seemed mundane and routine at the time, until fate decided to slap some sense into my otherwise complacent existence. My partner for the day, Darius Anafrechuk, couldn't have been less like me, a tall, lanky Ukrainian with a wicked sense of humor despite his inevitably somber line of work. We were assigned to investigate a suspected heist of weapons-grade uranium in the heavily forested outskirts of Eureka, in Humboldt County, California. The operation was supposed to be swift and uneventful. Little did we know the real danger lurking among the ancient redwood trees. Our first day chasing leads went by without much fanfare, leads ultimately leading nowhere until about 3.15 p.m. when we found a tiny hidden cave just large enough for a couple of people to squeeze through. What initially seemed innocuous took on a more unsettling aspect when we noticed strange scratch marks etched deep into the rock on either side of the cave entrance. Bemused and curious, Darius quipped, what do we have here? A wannabe artist among criminals? Nevertheless, we forged ahead cautiously, taking our time to explore every crevice and corner of that rocky void. Deeper within the cave, strange incidences began occurring like whispers echoing throughout, scurrying in between the shadows, and you could swear something touched your shoulder. Our surroundings made us feel increasingly uneasy as darkness enveloped us, seemingly attempting to swallow us whole. With our objectives still set on finding evidence of the stolen uranium, we ignored our nagging sense of unease that crept up behind us like an insidious cold draft. Suddenly Darius's flashlight began flickering wildly before dying altogether. In those moments before darkness engulfed us completely, his utter silence sent tendrils of fear spiraling through my being. Seconds felt like an eternity before Darius's labored breathing reached my ears, and I could make out his whisper. I found something. It looks like a body. Frozen in place, I directed the dim beam of my flashlight to where he was pointing and my heart nearly leapt out of my chest. Lying contorted beside a scratched-up crate that presumably held uranium was what remained of a man, or rather, the gnarled shell of one. The victim looked like he had been violently shredded by an animal with unimaginable strength. What on earth could have done this? Darius choked out, his usual levity extinguished by the ghastly sight before us. We searched in vain for any culprits, human or animal alike, but there wasn't a soul nor creature that would match up to the mangles we've witnessed. Suddenly, something shifted above, causing tremors throughout otherwise eerily quiet atmosphere. The sudden tremors above us caused a shower of debris to rain down around us, 
and I instinctively shielded my face with my hands. We need to get the hell out of here. I shouted, grabbing Darius by the arm and pulling him away from the horrifying scene. As we made our way back to the cave entrance, we couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched, hunted even. My heart raced as every shadow seemed to come alive, stalking us with menacing intent. When we finally burst out into the open air, gasping for breath among the towering redwoods, I felt a mixture of relief and overwhelming dread. Darius frantically dialed for backup while I glanced around, trying to assess our surroundings. The once serene forest now felt like a living nightmare. Just when we thought we had escaped whatever was inside that cave, an ear-piercing roar erupted from the trees above us. And then it emerged. A monstrous creature that looked like something straight out of folklore, a hideous hybrid of beast and man. It had shaggy fur covering its elongated body, with twisted claws sprouting from its powerful limbs. Its face was terrifyingly human-like yet grotesquely distorted, contorted into an eternal snarl exposing rows of monstrous teeth. What in God's name is that thing? Darius muttered, his voice shaking as he fumbled for his sidearm. But deep down, we both knew that standard-issue firearms wouldn't save us from this ferocious abomination. As if sensing our fear, the creature eagerly lunged towards us, and in that split second, I remembered hearing about an old local legend whispered among the townsfolk. The story went that an ancient shapeshifter named Moron inhabited these woods after escaping from Eastern Europe centuries ago, hunting and devouring those who ventured too close to his territory. Not believing in such superstitions, I had brushed it off as nothing more than a fable. But now, staring into the face of death itself, I realized the truth. Moron was real. Instinctively taking charge, Darius and I managed to evade the creature's vicious attacks as we scrambled back to our vehicle. Its powerful claws ripped through solid wood-like paper, and its roars echoed with bloodthirsty desire. Just as we reached the safety of our vehicle, I recalled that we had stowed some hunting rifles in the trunk, jokingly referring to them as Plan B during our earlier investigations. Forced to confront this nightmare head-on, they suddenly became our last hope. I clumsily loaded a rifle and fired shot after shot at the relentless creature. Whether due to my shaking hands or the beast's unnatural agility, each bullet was passed harmlessly. Darius soon grabbed a second gun as we alternated between shooting and hurriedly reloading praying for an unlucky hit that might slow this monstrous force down before it tore us to shreds. What felt like an eternity later, one of Darius' rounds miraculously pierced the creature's shoulder. Hindered but not defeated, Moro let out an agonizing howl before retreating back into the dense forest. For a moment, we stood in shock, not quite believing that we had survived such a life-altering encounter. It seemed that luck alone had kept us alive this day, though either of us would ever view Eureka or those ancient redwoods the same way again. Later, with backup finally arriving on site and dozens of law enforcement officers illuminating every corner of that cursed forest, Darius and I found solace in recounting our horrifying ordeal. We desperately tried to piece together the unknown history of Moro, the shapeshifter of whose origin was now defined by loss and carnage. As we delved deeper into his twisted past, we could only wonder what transformative events had led him to become the beast we face today. But perhaps the most disturbing realization was that Moro was still out there, wounded but far from finished. And as darkness fell upon Eureka once more, the chilling truth remained painfully clear. Although we had momentarily escaped the clutches of death, 
We may not be so fortunate next time. It was during my break at the small town coffee shop that I realized my passion for coffee. On this particular day, I'd just finished a grueling extermination job at an old Victorian house when I decided to grab a cup of joe. I found myself ordering a double espresso from the tired-looking barista while muttering some wisecrack to lighten the mood. Now let me tell you about this particular extermination job I had been called for. It all began a couple of weeks ago. My boss, Jonah Barr, sent me to the town of Lansdale, Pennsylvania. We had received numerous complaints about an infestation of sorts that nobody seemed to be able to figure out. So I knew that whatever awaited me there wouldn't be your average extermination gig. As the days passed by and I worked on various properties, there seemed to be something more sinister going on that even the most experienced exterminators were baffled by. Whispers of strange happenings and mysterious creatures circulated through the town folks' conversations, though they seemed reluctant to share any more details with an outsider like me. One chilly evening, after wrapping up at yet another desperately infested home, I stumbled upon a woman trembling outside her front door. She looked frantic and disheveled as she told me about a hideous creature in her basement that had shredded her beloved collection of vinyl records. She described it as something she had never seen before, an unnaturally tall entity with long limbs and twisted claws perfect for ripping things apart. I could tell she was serious about what she'd witnessed, so without hesitation, I made my way to her home's grimy basement. The air was heavy and thick, and the smell of mold was unlike anything I had ever experienced in decades of working in pest control. As I searched every corner and crevice with my flashlight, something suddenly sparked my attention halfway up one wall. Smeared markings that seemed to be a combination of claw marks and a thick, viscous substance that had an overpowering stench. I carefully examined the substance and noticed it was much too bizarre to be anything related to an infestation I'd previously encountered. This wasn't just an ordinary job. Unbeknownst to me, an eerie presence slithered in the shadows, biding its time until I had my back turned. It struck with such force that I tumbled across the slimy basement floor. My experience as an exterminator told me that retreat would be futile, so mustering all my strength and courage, I rose to face this mysterious creature head-on. Despite my cunning maneuvers and attempts to trap the elusive attacker, it always seemed to be one step ahead of me. The creature leaped from wall to wall with grace and agility, defying logic and the limits of any living creature I'd encountered. All of a sudden, the monstrous figure lunged towards me and scuffed my arm with its serrated claw-like arm extension, flinging me into a crumbling stack of boxes filled with long-forgotten possessions. Just when I thought the end was imminent, a ray of light flickered from another part of the basement. At that precise moment, an ear-piercing blast shook the house's foundations as a team of SWAT officers burst through doors and windows. The thunderous cacophony seemed to disorient the creature momentarily, but it wasn't enough for them, or for me, to get the upper hand on our persistent foe. As sirens blared in the background and chaos ensued around us, I knew this wouldn't end well not for myself nor for those individuals involved in this dire situation. The grotesque being confidently cornered us one by one despite our desperate efforts to fend it off, it became abundantly clear there was nothing we could do against this unearthly adversary, an antagonist, unlike anything we'd ever faced in our darkest nightmares. 
As the creature's blood-curdling screeches echoed throughout the house, the remaining few of U.S. sought refuge behind a crumbling wall. Trapped behind the deteriorating wall, we could hear the creature outside, its menacing footsteps tapping in an irregular pattern. Recollecting my thoughts, I knew I had to come up with a plan. My years of experience as an exterminator offered no solutions for this supernatural foe. But doing nothing was no longer an option. In a hushed tone, I discussed my idea with the remaining officers, distract the creature long enough for me to call for backup while they secured the area. Although I could sense their skepticism due to our inability to harm the creature so far, they reluctantly agreed as we all knew that police reinforcement was our best bet. As two officers cautiously ventured out from our hiding spot, creating noise and drawing the attention of the creature, I managed to sneak away to make my call. The department sent a special unit as soon as they heard of our encounter. Meanwhile, our distressing situation escalated when the creature attacked one of the officers and devoured him gruesomely before us, splattering blood and bits of flesh on all nearby surfaces. The other officer managed to escape back behind the crumbling wall just in time before being spotted. While waiting in dread for reinforcements, a local historian named Jacob approached us explaining that he believed he knew what we were dealing with, the Lansdale Lacerator. A horrifying creature thought to be a mere myth, it was notorious for savagely tearing apart its victims with unnerving precision in this small town over the past century. Jacob mentioned that while there were many theories of how it came into existence, or what kept it alive, nobody knew for sure. As we pondered these disturbing revelations, our backup arrived and surrounded the house. Prepared with heavy-duty weapons and containment equipment, they strategically ventured inside. The onslaught that followed was truly horrifying. Gunshots rang out in all directions as the limbs of fallen officers joined shattered furniture in a sea of blood-soaked debris. It became chillingly evident that even the special unit was ill-equipped to deal with this otherworldly fiend. As the creature continued its rampage, the survivors retreated to a safe distance. We were bewildered at our failure, knowing that the town of Lansdale would likely suffer the same gruesome fate as our fallen comrades if we didn't find a way to subdue or eliminate this monstrous being. That was when Jacob revealed one last crucial detail. The Lansdale Lacerator could not pursue victims beyond the town's borders. This information practically made me sick, aware that my extermination job had brought all those involved in this gruesome battle into danger. Forcefully, I instructed everyone to head towards the town limits. In order not to abandon the townsfolk, we made it our mission to warn them of the impending doom and strongly suggest they evacuate as well. As we watched and waited for any sign of that inhuman horror emerging from the decimated house, we grimaced at the destruction left behind. Remains of torn flesh and scattered limbs are frightful reminders of who has met their grisly demise at the wicked claws of the creature. Leaving Lansdale behind us, I remained uneasy, wondering what happened after we escaped its reach. What occurred next in that small town? Does the Lansdale Lacerator still lurk within those borders? The thought sends shivers down our necks. But for now, all we can do is keep moving forward and away from this harrowing experience. My name is Akachita Tibuan, and I'll never forget the time my family and I had a horrifying encounter with a creature out of Cherokee lore. It was a sweltering summer day, 
and my family decided to spend it at the Chattahoochee National Forest in northern Georgia. We wanted to enjoy a casual hike through the woods and have a relaxing picnic, thinking that we'd only be battling mosquitoes and midday heat. We set out early in the morning so that we could get as much activity as possible before the afternoon heat struck. As we walked deeper into the forest, the atmosphere felt sinister, almost like being wrapped in an invisible shroud. Despite my misgivings, I tried cracking some jokes to lighten the mood. Why don't scientists trust atoms? Because they make up everything, I said, laughing while my sister rolled her eyes. As we continued our hike, we suddenly heard an awful sound in the distance, a loud collision of metal followed by agonizing screams. Panic swept over us as we debated whether to find out what happened or move away from whatever had caused those noises. We hesitated for a moment before deciding to suck it up and figure out what was going on. We made our way to where the sound came from, carefully, as dread filled each step. As we approached the site of the incident, the sight that unfolded before us took our breaths away. Before us lay a car crash scene. A car seemed to have hit a tree head-on at high speed, and among the mangled metal lay its driver, near death. Their body was deformed beyond recognition. Every bone appeared broken, and blood stained everything. What was left of their jaws quivered as they struggled for breath. Oh, go, are you? They managed to wheeze before dying right before us. That was when it struck us. These were not just gruesome accidents. The words they uttered referred to an ancient Cherokee legend about a skinwalker who takes on the form of different creatures to ambush and kill unsuspecting victims. As we tried to process what had just happened, we felt a deep sinking feeling in our stomachs as if the surrounding trees were closing in on us. I reached into my backpack and ceremoniously pulled out a revered Cherokee artifact passed down through generations in my family, the Bloodstone. It was said to have the power to reveal evil spirits in their true form. I hoped it would guide us in dealing with this terrifying creature. And it worked, up to an extent. We noticed fleeting glimpses of the creature's unnatural movements in our peripheral vision, its grotesque shadow stalking us behind leaves and branches as we trudged onward. We realized that we wouldn't be able to outrun this being. Instead, I had an idea. I clumsily crafted a shoddy trap with several pieces of string and some sticks that I found scattered around us and as a last resort, set it up near the path where the creature could potentially walk sweating nervously. The four of us backed away from the trap, leaving it barely visible but functional. With bated breath, it seemed like time itself had come to a standstill as we waited for any sort of action or reaction from our hidden nemesis. Suddenly, we heard rustling nearby. Peeking through the underbrush, the abomination revealed itself and walked confidently through the forest, directly toward our poorly disguised snare. The beast was a horrifying mix of human and animal features, with elongated limbs, an unnaturally twisted spine, and a sickly gaunt face that seemed to be locked in an eternal grimace. The skin was rotting away, revealing the ooze and decay beneath. Its eyes burned with a malicious intelligence that sent chills running through our veins. It stepped closer to the trap, sniffing it suspiciously but continuing on its path. As fate would have it, the creature's foot became ensnared in our makeshift trap. It shrieked, an unearthly cross between a howl and screech, and we seized our chance, bolting from our hiding places to run for safety. As we sprinted away from the infuriated monster, I considered calling for help but realized that no one would believe us unless they saw the creature themselves. 
Additionally, modern technology had barely any signal within the dense forest. Our mobile phones were practically useless. We rushed toward a nearby house, seeking refuge. We hammered on the door until an elderly woman opened it slowly, her eyes widening as she took in our disheveled appearances. She ushered us inside before we could stumble over an explanation or apology. Adaru, she whispered once we shut the door behind us. I've heard of it before, evil spirits of vengeance and misery. She recounted a story her grandmother had told her, one about powerful medicine men who delved too deeply into black magic and lost their humanity. They became things like Aguru, sinister creatures that thrived on fear, death, and bloodshed. We spent hours in the elderly woman's house, listening to her stories of folklore while she brewed cups of tea. Exhausted, we sought refuge in her humble home as the sun began to set. But no sooner had nightfall arrived than we heard a terrible wail outside, the vengeful cry of an enraged monster. Despite our terror, we knew that we couldn't remain hiding in the house. The Aguru would find us eventually, and there was no telling what it would do to the kind woman who had sheltered us. Gathering our courage, we decided to face the creature head on. Clutching the bloodstone tightly in my hand, our group burst from the house into the night. The Aguru was waiting, and its wounds healed with unnerving speed. It brandished its claws menacingly as those burning eyes seared into us. Since standard weapons wouldn't work against such a creature, I focused on wielding the power of the bloodstone. As I concentrated, a blinding light emanated from the stone, casting grotesque shadows on the trees and causing the Agarit to wail in agony. We charged forward, determined to push it back as far as possible. The struggle continued for what felt like eternity. At every turn, we pushed it back only for it to regain ground when exhaustion threatened to overwhelm us. Dawn broke upon us, tired, bruised, but still alive, with no trace of Aguru in sight. Though we couldn't destroy or capture it, it seemed our efforts had driven it away temporarily. The grateful elderly woman bade us goodbye as we trudged exhaustedly back towards civilization. We couldn't help but glance over our shoulders every few minutes, half expecting those hateful eyes to emerge from the trees. But for now, only for now, the Agara left us alone. Its threats still lingered in every shadow, filling our thoughts even as we lay down to sleep that night. Perhaps one day it would come searching for revenge again and ensnare new victims in its vicious grasp. We could only hope that when that day came, someone else would be able to hold their ground against this relentless force of darkness as we had on this harrowing night. I was standing next to the old water tower, puffing on my cigarette, while trying to figure out how to approach this group of rowdy teenagers about their illegal bonfire. Being a park ranger in Faraday National Park isn't always a walk in the park, especially when you have to deal with stubborn kids just trying to have some fun. In the midst of my dilemma, Frank came up with an ingenious solution. What do you say we just grab their marshmallows and run? As I grinned at his idea, I noticed something moving in the trees, something that didn't fit in this neck of the woods especially not on such an otherwise lovely and carefree Saturday night. The air seemed to shift around us as we nervously exchanged glances. Over by the bonfire, the teenagers were engrossed in their oversized mugs of spiked root beers and exaggerated tales of high school glory days. They hadn't realized that we'd even approached them yet. 
shrugging off our anxiousness and doing our best not to alarm them, Frank and I went ahead with our brilliant marshmallow heist. While executing the plan went well, it became increasingly difficult for me to ignore the nagging sensation that something sinister was just out of sight. Returning back to our ranger vehicles parked in a nearby clearing with our spoils, we decided to make a quick stop at a cabin nearby, one we used for brief breaks or emergencies. Inside the musty yet cozy cabin, we made small talk about work and family life while preparing hot cocoa to accompany our stolen marshmallows. It wasn't long before the uneasy feeling inside me heightened, and my eyes kept drifting toward a small window that offered a slim view into the darkness outside. Just then, Danny called us, another park ranger, claiming he saw someone wandering around near one of the campsites meant for large groups. With apprehension tightening in my chest, Frank and I decided to investigate, deciding it would be best to stick together. As we edged closer to the campsite, we heard what sounded like choked sobs. Frank pulled out his flashlight and slowly illuminated the scene before us. A man dressed in tattered clothing lay near his truck, immobile except for his quivering. His limbs had been horrifically twisted, bent at angles that defied human physiology, and blood slowly oozed from dozens of gashes across his body. We rushed forward to help, fighting to keep our stomachs in check as we struggled to assess his injuries, working swiftly but carefully to stabilize him as much as possible. As we did so, we became acutely aware that although the ambient noise of the forest had continued unabated, the laughter and crackling bonfire from the teenagers had vanished entirely. Frank called for backup while I managed to get the broken man situated in one of our vehicles. We knew medical assistance was crucial, but we couldn't shake the unsettling feeling that we were being watched. That icy dread has never been far from my thoughts since that fateful day. This sense of impending doom only worsened when backup arrived and swept through the formerly raucous campsite. They found the smoldering remnants of a fire pit and abandoned blankets scattered across the ground like the remnants of an unfinished picnic. No trace was left behind except their meager belongings. With no way of knowing where they went or why they left, terror began to take hold as we realized that whatever horror had befallen this lone man might have claimed other victims as well, individuals whose fates were yet unknown. As I looked out into the night, my heart raced, thinking about what unknown foe lurked just beyond my sight. As I stood there, shivering in the cold night, my heart raced, thinking about the unknown foe lurking just beyond my sight. Frank and I decided to split up momentarily to survey the surrounding area. Armed with our flashlights and firearms, we lurked cautiously through the darkened woods, dread weighing heavily on our minds. It was approximately twenty minutes into our search when I spotted a trail of blood leading off into a more secluded area. Feeling both apprehension and determination, I followed the crimson trail as it twisted around trees and rocks. In this undisturbed part of the woods, I could feel an unwarranted presence looming close by. At 9.47 p.m. that same night, I stumbled upon a disturbing sight. The mangled bodies of two of the missing teenagers laid atop a bed of bloodied leaves. The expression on their faces was frozen in terror, mouths agape from their final moments of horror. Their twisted limbs were unnaturally bent in gruesome positions, and deep gashes covered their bodies. Despite my exposure to violent incidents in the park throughout my career, nothing could have prepared me for such macabre carnage. I radioed Frank to report my findings before attempting to trace back to where this sinister trail began. Skulking further into the forest, 
I heard a rustling sound behind me and reflexively swung around with my flashlight, scanning the darkness. A hulking shape lunged out from between the shadows. Its eyes were malevolent black hollows set against a face marred with cuts and caked in blood. Its grotesque mouth stretched into a repulsive grin as its muscular arms reached toward me with menacing intent. I immediately fired several shots but somehow missed each time. It was as if this creature could evade bullets with ease. Panic set in as I tried to distance myself from this monstrous being that defied all logic. Having eventually lost it momentarily, I contacted Frank again panting and struggling to form words. Frank, there's something in the woods. Get everyone back to headquarters. I hastily relayed the urgency of the situation as my voice betrayed my fear. Within minutes, we had managed to regroup at our main facility. We started piecing together a plan of action when Danny interrupted us clutching an old leather-bound journal that once belonged to the park's original founder, a man named Erasmus Blackwood, who disappeared under mysterious circumstances over fifty years ago. As it turned out, Erasmus had conducted experiments injecting strange concoctions into park animals to create unnatural hybrids with the twisted goal of creating a new wildlife hierarchy within Faraday National Park. The beast we encountered that night was one of his failed creations, a horrifying amalgamation of human and animal traits, driven by insatiable bloodlust. Shuddering in revulsion with this newfound information, the threat became even more imminent than we initially thought. With no choice but to confront this monstrosity head-on and protect ourselves and the park visitors, we mobilized our entire team and armed ourselves with an arsenal fit for combat. From 10.23 p.m. on that unforgettable night, we searched for any signs of the creature and prepared for a fight like no other. The intense encounter lasted throughout the night. Torrential waves of fear washed over us as bullets resonated through the darkened forest. Finally, as daybreak emerged and sunlight filtered through the trees at around 5.12 a.m., we trapped the creature in a cave deep within the park's terrain. Determined not to risk another death under our watch, my park ranger colleagues and I decided to seal off that part of Faraday National Park forever, condemning Erasmus Blackwood's abomination to live out its days in darkness and isolation. Though our friends and law enforcement were perplexed by that night's events, we all agreed it was best to keep the truth hidden, officially marking it as an unexplained anomaly to protect the park's reputation and assure the safety and peace of mind for its future visitors. Time has marched on, but I know that a part of me will forever reside within the chilling memories of that haunting night. The gruesome images of those we couldn't save remain everlasting, while the knowledge that somewhere within Faraday National Park lies a monstrosity born from a man-man's ambitions remains buried deep within us and embedded in the fabric of this once serene sanctuary. It was one of those idyllic summer afternoons when everyone seemed to have shed their worries, and the world looked as colorful as a postcard. My name is Jack, and I'm a truck driver by profession. With the warm sun guiding my way, I drove my 18-wheeler past rolling green pastures, humming a cheerful little tune as I went. My destination was a rural town in Nebraska because I had a pickup scheduled there. As I rolled into town, I noticed an elderly man walking alongside the road with a cane. He raised his hand for help, and being the good Samaritan I am, and to flex my wit, I stopped and asked, Hey sir, do you need some wheels? The old man smiled and climbed into my truck with great difficulty. 
We exchanged pleasantries as we headed towards his house on the outskirts of town. Along the journey, he reminisced about the colorful characters he had encountered in his youth. One character stood out, a man called Pete's Shadow, who was rumored to roam the woods after sundown. I couldn't help but laugh at this supposed shadowy figure lurking in the peaceful countryside. You folks need better hobbies, I joked. The old man chuckled and replied, Well, son, sometimes tales keep people safe from things they shouldn't be meddling with. We finally reached the old man's home, a cozy yellow house that looked like it belonged in a painting. As he got down from my truck, I saw him wince in pain. His deteriorating health made me wonder how he managed to live in this isolated area. Over the next few days, while driving back and forth within this picturesque little town, it was hard not to feel insulated from all the troubles of urban life. However, that deceptive sense of security was soon shattered. Just before dusk one day, as I drove near a dense patch of woods, I saw a man emerge from the trees and walk towards the road. He was tall, lanky, and undeniably unkempt. His clothes were dirty and torn, and his disheveled hair hung around his gaunt face like seaweed draping off a sunken ship. An eerie calmness surrounded him as he stood by the roadside and I instinctively knew that offering him a ride would not be wise. Instead, I accelerated my truck and sped as far away from him as possible. By the time I reached the nearest gas station, my heart was pounding wildly in my chest. Something about the man's deep-set eyes had unsettled me to my core. While refueling my truck, I asked the attendant if he had ever seen a man like that around. The attendant quizzically questioned my description before slowly shaking his head. I could tell that his curiosity was piqued now, though. As we continued chatting, an unnerving thought crept into my mind. Was this strange character somehow connected to those folk tales surrounding Pete's shadow? Having delivered my cargo for the day, I started driving back to the motel where I was staying. The sun dipped below the horizon, casting a sinister pall over everything. And it began, that lurking feeling of dread intensified with each passing mile, as if that ghastly figure were right behind me. Before long, erratic noises resounded in the distance, scratching tires, muffled screams, adding to my pounding headache. The situation quickly spiraled into chaos as a whole slew of peculiar events transpired around me. The road ahead seemed eerily deserted. The flickering streetlights offer no comfort, while each bend in the road promised dreadful encounters. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a blood-soaked body sprawled on the pavement just ahead of me. As I swerved hard to avoid it, and slammed on the brakes with sweat pouring down my face. The bloodied figure on the road left me paralyzed with terror. With my hands gripping the steering wheel, it suddenly struck me, is this the handiwork of Pete's shadow, a demented psychopath inflicting pain and fear upon unsuspecting victims? Was he hunting again? Had I become his next target? I knew I couldn't just sit and wait for what was to come. I quickly realized that I needed to gather more information about this mysterious individual. With hesitance, I picked up my phone and dialed the number of the old man I had met a few days earlier. To my relief, he answered promptly. Listen, I said nervously. I think I might have come across this Pete's shadow you mentioned. Is there any way you can help me figure out what to do next? Well, he replied slowly, I suggest you go to the local sheriff's station. They should have records on such incidents and maybe even a clue about Pete's shadow. Without wasting any time, 
I drove straight to the sheriff's office. The officer at the front desk listened intently as I recounted my encounter with the strange man by the woods and shared my suspicions about his connection to Pete's shadow. He then escorted me to their archives, where we scoured old newspaper clippings and files for any pertinent information. Finally, we stumbled upon an article from twenty years ago detailing a string of gruesome attacks in the woods around town. The victims had been left with deep lacerations, their bodies mangled in unnatural positions. The attacker was eventually dubbed Pete's Shadow. Due to his elusive nature and lack of evidence pointing to a human perpetrator, the officer looked at me gravely. Your encounter lines up with these attacks, he said. He has never been caught or identified, but if it is indeed Pete's shadow that you saw, you're fortunate to have escaped unharmed. I decided then not to call anybody else for help. Doing so might spread panic in town or expose more people to this dangerous threat. Instead, I resolved to keep an eye out for any suspicious activity and report it immediately. After leaving the sheriff's office, I decided to confront the old man who had first told me about Pete's shadow. When I arrived at his house, I asked him why, after all this time, Pete's shadow continued to harm people. The old man sighed and explained that, according to legend, Pete's shadow was once a man named Peter who, tormented by his own dark past, sought to inflict pain on others as a twisted form of solace. Unable to come to terms with his actions or find peace in life, he now haunted the woods, unable to fully leave the world behind. That night, as I lay in bed at the motel, I couldn't shake the chilling encounter from my thoughts. Foolishly brave and unable to sleep, I decided to drive past the woods where I saw the man earlier. Perhaps the horror would subside if I confronted it head-on. As if sensing my presence, Pete's shadow appeared in my headlights beam with blood-stained hands and a macabre grin etched on his face. My pulse raced. An instinct screamed for me to escape before becoming another one of his victims. But inexplicably reaching for my steering wheel lock instead of the ignition key, I decided to face him down, in the only way that felt right for me. I slowly stepped out of my truck as Pete's shadow stood still, staring at me coldly through hollow eyes. His creepiness intensified as each second passed. In a flurry of movement fueled by raw determination not experienced before in my life, I swung the steering wheel lock with all my might. The impact left him dazed but still standing. He was no mere mortal man. Seeing that my attack did little damage prompted me to quickly retreat back into my truck and flee the scene at breakneck speed. As the figure grew smaller in my rearview mirror, a sense of relief washed over me, but I knew this wouldn't be our last encounter. Now more than ever before, I believe Pete's shadow walks among us, a ghastly reminder that darkness and fear lurk even in the most idyllic of places. My encounter with him has left me scarred but wiser, knowing that evil awaits to prey on the unsuspecting. Be careful out there. Pete's shadow could be watching, waiting to torment his next victim. My everyday life has been an endless routine for years, no different from any other truck driver across the United States. I'm just a regular guy doing regular things. You wouldn't expect something out of the ordinary to happen to someone like me. But it did. It was in Jackson, Mississippi, during a regular run between Memphis and New Orleans. I had a cup of coffee at a cozy little diner that I regularly visited. 
A friendly local joked about the way northerners talk, and I laughed it off as good-natured banter. Life was simple and honestly kind of monotonous. That evening, I parked my truck in my regular spot near a rest area and prepared for another night in my sleeper cab. An eerie calm hung in the air that night, which made me feel somewhat uneasy, a feeling I hadn't experienced before. Before calling it a night, I stepped outside to take a final gulp of fresh air and stretched my legs one last time. It was largely abandoned, aside from an old sedan parked under the dimly lit street lamp with a couple arguing a few feet away. Just as I was about to head back to my truck, something caught my eye on the edge of the tree lean. A man, at least six feet tall and visibly muscular, stood there, watching me with narrowed eyes. He wore a jacket with patches that seemed almost purposefully disoriented. His face was shrouded under a wide-brimmed cowboy hat but had an unsettling smirk that sent chills down my spine. With each step closer to my truck, he mirrored me, maintaining his distance but never taking his gaze off of me. I quickly climbed into my rig and locked all the doors before putting all the curtains up for added security. My heartbeat pounded in my ears as I lay in bed, trying to comprehend what had just happened. Every fiber of my being told me to leave. So at the crack of dawn... I fired up the engine and hit the road. As I was pulling out of the parking lot, I glanced at the tree lean one last time and saw that I wasn't being pursued, but my instincts told me that this wasn't over. Over the next few days, I felt a constant sense of unease that followed me like a shadow. It seemed as if I were being haunted by that man from the tree lean. I couldn't shake the paranoia. One evening, during a stop in Birmingham, Alabama, I met an older gentleman who introduced himself as a fellow trucker named Tom. He shared a story with me about how he once encountered a sinister individual on the road who terrorized him for months before vanishing without a trace. Our conversation left me with an even deeper sense of dread. Finally, my fears became reality when I reached Montgomery for a fuel stop. While checking my oil levels in between fueling, out of the corner of my eye, there he was, the man from Jackson, standing near an old pickup truck, still wearing that menacing smirk. The most unsettling part was that nobody seemed to notice him or his intentions. As panic rose within me, those final moments of our encounter in Jackson replayed in my mind like a glitchy recording. I hiked up into my cab and hightailed it out of there as fast as company policy allowed. The next week turned into a living nightmare. Random, untraceable phone calls to my dispatcher asking about my routes. Odd packages addressed to me in random mailboxes left open on seemingly deserted streets whispers at truck stops that felt too close for comfort, all instances getting more intense every time. My life turned from monotonous to dreadful overnight. It felt like my own personal horror film unfolding before my very eyes, one scene at a time. Finally making it back to Memphis on yet another run between Baton Rouge and Nashville. I felt completely drained by the experiences over the past few weeks. Every face I encountered appeared like a twisted version of the sinister man. I couldn't help but suspect everyone I met. That dark and quiet evening, after a meager meal at a 24-hour diner, I retraced the steps back to my truck, dreading what could come next. In that parking lot, there was not a soul to be found. The air was thick with tension as my heartbeat thudded through my body like a desperate SOS call. I decided it was time to act. I needed to find and confront this man who had invaded my existence, slipping in between the small routines that made up my life. 
It was worth a shot if it meant getting back to my normalcy. I started asking around truck stops, showing people a sketch of the man's face. Most people shook their heads and insisted they'd never seen him before. But one older woman stared at the image for a moment before revealing that she recognized the man. His name was Dean, and apparently... He had some sort of twisted history with truck drivers, terrorizing them and destroying their lives as if it were a grotesque game. The next day, I found myself parked in an abandoned warehouse parking lot where Dean was rumored to frequent. I waited inside my truck, gripping a tire iron that I planned to use in case things turned physical. Late into the night, I saw him emerge from the shadows, his tall frame looming as he first approached cautiously before seeing my truck. His eyes gleamed maliciously as he prepared to descend on his prey. As he neared my vehicle, I silently got out through the driver's side door. I crept up behind him and swung the tire iron with all my strength at his unsuspecting head. The impact created a sickening thud mixed with the crunch of metal meeting bone. Dean fell motionless to the ground. Blood spread slowly from under his form, but he still breathed shallowly, alive but clearly disoriented. What do you want from me? I screamed at him, my voice breaking with frustration and fear. Without uttering a word or regaining consciousness, a blood-stained smile traced over Dean's lips. Mystified by his silence, I searched his jacket pockets until I found a crumpled piece of paper that contained details about me, my full name, family members' names, truck route information, everything. It felt like a gut punch, the sheer intensity of the invasion of my privacy. I called the police and they took Dean into custody, assuring me that he would not get away with his deeds. As the days wore on, I found out that his previous victims had been found dead, brutally killed in locations spread throughout Mississippi and Alabama. Sleep still didn't come easy for me after everything, but I couldn't help but feel grateful to be alive. One day, when I returned to my truck after a routine delivery, I discovered an envelope filled with more disturbing details, this time about other truck drivers whom I suspected were targeted by Dean or his accomplices. I made a difficult decision. Every driver deserved a right to know if they were in danger. Tracking each one down in person became my mission. But as the weeks passed, Letters continued to mysteriously show up in my sleeper cab. I started to wonder if Dean was more like a twisted idea or some sort of obsession that had been passed between criminal minds than just an isolated antagonist. The line between victim and accomplice seemed blurred as each person I reached out to began experiencing strange occurrences similar to mine. A year has elapsed since those events unfolded. The phantom letters have ceased for now. But still, whenever I stop at an unfamiliar truck lot and an unfamiliar vehicle parks near mine, silent trepidation grips at my heart. Just one of those days, I mumbled to myself, sipping my coffee as I gazed across the quiet streets. I spent over a decade working as a police officer in Ocala, and boredom was now a luxury I cherished. It had been uneventful lately, and for once, I was actually grateful. That moment of peace, however, would soon be shattered. Hey, we got a call from the nearby gas-and-go, my partner Mary said stepping into the patrol car. The clerk reported some strange activity out back. Been happening for a few nights now. I nodded as we drove toward the gas station on Parker Street. 
Well, let's see what all the fuss is about. We arrived within minutes and talked to the jittery clerk, who pointed us to the storage area behind the building. From his description, it sounded like small-time vandals causing trouble. Mary and I approached cautiously, ready for anything. The storage area was shrouded in darkness. Discarded shipping pallets and garbage littered the ground. There was something unsettling about this place, a strange atmosphere that made my skin crawl. Is that blood? Mary whispered, pointing to a crimson trail that led away from us. We followed it around a corner, where we discovered something that sent a shiver down my spine. Animal carcasses with their entrails torn out, dumped in a grotesque heap. As we stared at the gruesome scene, Mary gagged and stumbled back, unable to process what we'd found. I grabbed her arm to steady her when, out of nowhere, came a chilling screech that froze us where we stood. What the foo dash! My words cut short as something rushed past us in the shadows at an unnatural speed. We didn't catch sight of it clearly, but it left another carcass in its wake. It bore similar wounds to the others, organs strewn about haphazardly. Call for backup, I stammered, my hand shaking as I drew my gun. Mary did the same, her voice cracking as she spoke into the radio, requesting assistance. The sounds of smashing glass and overturned crates echoed in the darkness. Whatever this thing was, it seemed to be everywhere at once, toying with us like prey in its twisted game. It moved with purpose, a predator in its element. It appeared again, a flash of movement in the dim light. This time we saw it up close a horrendous amalgamation of flesh and bone unlike anything I'd ever seen. Its maw was filled with rows of jagged teeth, wide enough to swallow a man whole. It let out another ear-splitting screech before disappearing once more into the shadows. What are we dealing with here? Mary shouted over the chaos, fear evident in her voice. I don't know, I replied grimly stumbling through the darkness as the creature continued its relentless assault. The storage area suddenly shook underfoot as unseen forces thrashed and crashed through anything that dared stand in their way, an invisible storm of destruction. Our minds were racing, trying to comprehend what was happening around us, when suddenly even our radios fell silent. Backups here! I whispered hopefully as we heard shouting and running not far from our position. The creature must have sensed that its time was running out. With a deafening roar, it lunged at us one last time, a blur of muscle and teeth tearing through the night. I fired my weapon wildly, but it hit only air as it slipped back into darkness. As our colleagues arrived in mass, the creature vanished leaving no evidence other than the slaughtered animals and shattered nerves that wouldn't be forgotten any time soon. We exchanged glances with our fellow officers, everybody asking the same question. What was that? The answer never came. It was as if the creature had never existed. It didn't take long for word to spread about the terrifying incident. People talked in hushed whispers, speculating on the identity of the mysterious creature that had wreaked havoc on the town. Some believed it was a wild animal that had wandered away from its natural habitat, while others insisted it was some genetic experiment gone wrong. By the second day following the attack, it felt like the entire town was holding its breath. The streets were deserted long before nightfall, with people locking themselves in their homes fearing another visit from our bloodthirsty assailant. I found myself unable to sleep and instead spent most nights poring over any information I could find about similar incidents in other small towns across America. On the fourth day following the attack, I was sitting in a local diner, nursing my iced tea while trying to gather my wits. 
My fellow officers and I were beyond exhausted when Angelo walked into the place. He slid into the booth across from me and promptly spat out his shocking revelation. Donnie, he started hesitantly. I think I found something. For a moment, I wanted to tell him to forget about it, that we should leave well enough alone. But my curiosity got the better of me. All right, Angelo. I sighed. What have you got? Angelo shared a harrowing tale of a man named Ezekiel Morrissey who lived in our town several decades ago. Ezekiel had long been rumored to be involved with dark powers and gruesome rituals hidden deep within the neighboring forest. As it turned out, that forest was situated just south of where our encounter with the beast had taken place. The strange thing is, Angelo continued, Morrissey disappeared without a trace many years ago, right around this very date. It can't be a coincidence. I muttered, There's definitely a connection between Ezekiel Morrissey and whatever attacked us that night. My thoughts raced as I recalled an old man I had once seen at the edge of town, dressed in ragged clothes and muttering to himself about the beast that had plagued both him and his ancestors for generations. There might be a connection. Angelo agreed. I heard about an old cabin out in the woods, near where Morrissey was last seen. My eyes widened. You don't think... I don't know, Angelo interrupted, but it might be worth checking out. Feeling a gnawing sense of unease, I decided against joining Angelo on his investigation. I couldn't shake the feeling that visiting the cabin was asking for trouble, and by the same token, I didn't want to make myself or my fellow officers a target either. There was something truly evil lurking at the heart of this mystery and getting too close could be fatal. Over the next few days, it seemed as though our fears were confirmed when there were more strange occurrences, screams in the night, odd talismans left on doorsteps, and even more vicious deaths that bore an eerie resemblance to our first encounter with the creature. Angelo finally called me late one evening, his voice barely above a whisper. Donnie, we found something at the cabin. A journal. Ezekiel's journal it confirms everything. Ezekiel had summoned a demon as part of his dark rituals. He thought he could control it, but he couldn't. It looks like every few decades it comes back to wreak havoc on our town. As much as my rational mind wanted to dismiss Angelo's findings as nothing more than gibberish, deep down inside... I knew he was right. We couldn't fight this thing or destroy it. We could only wait for it to claim its victims and disappear again. The ordeal eventually faded into memory as people tried their best to forget all about Ezekiel Morrissey and the monstrous demon he had unleashed. It almost felt like an unspoken agreement across the town to bury the incident. But every now and then... When darkness falls and I see something move out of the corner of my eye, a shiver runs down my spine as I'm reminded of the terrible truth. The beast is still out there, waiting for the perfect opportunity to strike again. As a local private investigator in the quaint coastal town of Astoria, Oregon, I find myself taking on all sorts of cases, from petty disputes to more sinister events. My most recent case began as a typical day at the office. While sipping my morning coffee, I received a call from an anguished woman who needed my help. The thing stalking me is like nothing I've ever encountered. She gasped into the phone. I immediately perked up. This wasn't my usual client call. She went on with her story, detailing how she had stumbled upon the aftermath of its carnage during her nightly walks by the shore. 
The gruesome scene left her nauseous and trembling with fear. Each time, something unsettling would catch her eye, an oddly large footprint, or a strange feeling of being watched. I assured her I'd look into it, and for some reason, I found myself agreeing despite my initial doubts. Frankly, I couldn't resist the lure of this mystery. Little did I know that this case would lead me down a twisted path that would impact generations to come. Upon studying the coastal area where the woman's sightings took place, I began to notice subtle signs that suggested a large creature was indeed elegantly skipping through these shores. The peculiar tracks painted an unnerving portrait, so inexplicable and profound that it piqued my curiosity beyond measure. People whispered among themselves about what might be closing in on their otherwise peaceful town. An inescapable tension loomed over us as days turned into restless nights. Fearful citizens restricted their movements, as if bracing for an impending doom they couldn't quite fathom. I took it upon myself to consult with other local investigators who might have encountered similar events or heard whispers that could point me in the right direction. We spent days trying to connect the dots and build a profile of this elusive predator, one that continued to evade us with terrifying efficiency. In the following weeks, the nocturnal visitor left even more ghastly scenes that turned my stomach. A horrific cycle of bloodshed and terror left its mark on our once sleepy town. Every encounter with the unknown leaves its victims mangled and unrecognizable. The beast struck without mercy, leaving unimaginable suffering in its wake. A grim camaraderie emerged between those who had found themselves targeted by the elusive menace. We met frequently at hushed get-togethers and exchanged stories of harrowing encounters no one would dare believe. Throughout these meetings, I heard whispers about a mythic creature known as Bigfoot, but this seemed far too ludicrous for me to consider. However, as the days dragged on and the growing body count rose, I couldn't shake off the unnerving descriptions others had given me. This creature was nothing like anything we'd ever encountered before, an ancient being emerging from the depths of time to prey upon an unsuspecting modern world. I was startled out of my disoriented thoughts one chilly evening as I strolled through Astoria's eerily quiet streets. I realized I had stumbled upon the beast while it feasted upon its latest victim in a dimly lit alleyway just off the main road. The giant, hulking figure turned towards me, its eyes gleaming with a guttural growl vibrating from deep within its chest. A primal fear took hold of my entire being, yet my detective's instincts drove me to raise my flashlight, illuminating the monstrous shadow that loomed before me. The unnaturally large creature appeared almost human, with coarse, matted hair covering its body and distinct human-like facial expressions emanating from its twisted features. It lunged towards me with incredible speed for something so substantial in size. But just at that precise moment, a gunshot rang out, narrowly missing the beast. I looked around to see a man emerging from the shadows, a gun still smoking in his hand. I managed to dodge the Bigfoot's massive arm as it swatted angrily at me. The man rushed to my side, pulling me away from danger. The creature reared back in pain as another gunshot resounded its gut-wrenching roar filling the night air. Quick! We've got to move! The man shouted. His name was Daniel, and he was a local hunter who had been researching Bigfoot sightings for years. Together, we stumbled through dimly lit streets and alleys, hearing growls and snarls behind us. Daniel fired more shots behind us as he led me to his vehicle parked nearby. Inside his truck, he showed me documents suggesting that this particular Bigfoot had been terrorizing locals for months, with several disappearances attributed to it. 
What are we going to do? I asked as we sped away from the scene of carnage. Daniel looked as if he had been struggling with that question himself for quite some time. We have to find a way to stop it before it hurts anyone else. He said, his hands gripping the steering wheel with determination. But first, we need more information about its habits and weaknesses. Over the next few days, Daniel and I worked tirelessly to gather more evidence about this terrifying creature. We spoke to witnesses and local experts while conducting stakeouts near where the attacks had occurred. Bigfoot seemed to have an uncanny ability to avoid our attempts at contact or observation. One unforgettable night, as I stood guard outside a home where another attack had taken place just days earlier, I finally saw the beast again. It was cautiously approaching the house from behind a row of trees when Daniel leaped out of hiding, wielding a custom-made tranquilizer gun. The dart found its mark in the creature's thick hide, but Bigfoot merely yelped in irritation before taking off on foot, disappearing once more into the shadows. We were unable to track it, despite our tireless efforts. At our wit's end, we turned to the media to warn the residents of Astoria about the danger lurking among them. The mayor and the local authorities grew involved, organizing search parties and bringing in expert hunters from around the country for assistance. Our frantic hunt continued for weeks without results, until one fateful evening. A hermit named Earl, living deep in forested terrain on the outskirts of town, reported an attack on his property. During a raging storm that lashed through the region, with lightning flashing through the sky and flooding rain pounding down, he heard scratching at his door and the guttural growls of the fearsome creature. Earl grabbed his shotgun just as Bigfoot burst into his home, its large frame barely squeezing past the splintered wood. Earl managed to land a shot on its shoulder, but instead of stopping Bigfoot, it only enraged it further. As it snatched Earl's gun away and smashed it against the wall, he found himself cornered next to a flickering kerosene lamp. With no other option left and desperation driving him forward, Earl wrenched the lamp free from its stand and beamed with determination as he flung its fiery contents at the creature. In seconds, Bigfoot was engulfed in a torrent of flames, an otherworldly scream ringing out above the cacophony of rain. Stumbling in agony back out into the stormy night, it vanished once more. We never saw that particular Bigfoot again. The stories surrounding its existence became like many legends, part truth, part folklore. Some say it managed to escape that flaming confrontation and disappeared into hiding, while others believe that nature eventually claimed this elusive beast. As for Daniel and me, we moved on in our separate lives but remained bonded by the haunting encounter that had brought us together. I occasionally still find myself driving through the streets of Astoria, wondering if a shadow shifting in the corner of my eye is just an ordinary tree branch or something much more sinister lurking behind it. The mysteries surrounding Bigfoot still persist, and our questions about its motives, origins, and fate after that ominous night are left unanswered. As I gaze into the darkness on these sleepless nights, what I can't shake is the creeping sense that Bigfoot— or another creature like it, is still out there, waiting. I've always prided myself on keeping a level head. As an experienced hunter of cryptids, you'd think I'd seen everything by now. I've hunted beasts from all around the world from the Yeti in the Himalayas to the Chupacabra in Puerto Rico. But there was one creature that has always eluded me, until now. It all began on my trip to a small town in Louisiana, deep within the bayou. 
The town was no stranger to spooky stories and tales of supernatural beings lurking in the swamps. But this time, it went beyond local lore. A string of peculiar and gruesome incidents had been reported over the past few weeks, prompting me to start my investigation. At first, folks were hesitant to share their stories with an outsider like me, but eventually, they warmed up and opened up. They told tales of a terrifying beast haunting their land, leaving mangled remains in its wake. One evening during my stay, I went out with a group of locals to search for this creature. We combed through the swampy terrain as night fell. Careful not to make a sound, we moved quietly and cautiously. Suddenly, one of the locals froze in his tracks as he peered ahead into the murky darkness. Look, he whispered hoarsely, pointing at something we couldn't see just yet. As we approached closer, our flashlights revealed a grisly sight, a mutilated animal carcass no more than a few feet away from us. It had been torn apart with brute force, splattering blood and entrails across the mud and vegetation. Despite my strong stomach thanks to my line of work, even I struggled not to retch at that dreadful scene. This is just like... It's just like how it happened with those other creatures. One local murmured fearfully. We continued forward through murky waters and suffocating vegetation, scanning our surroundings for any sign of this creature. As we turned into a narrow pathway between the brush... I caught sight of a fleeting shape retreating into the ominous shadows. The next moment, I heard a horrible sound pierce through the tranquil air. It was an inhuman screech reverberating through the darkest corners of the swamp. What, what was that? stammered one local. Before I could even form a guess, a figure erupted from the undergrowth and lunged at the closest member of our group. They barely had time to react before they were viciously attacked. With increasing terror, I recognized the beast as it tore at its prey with nothing resembling mercy. It was none other than the famous Ruguru. Claws that looked like hooked daggers sliced through flesh as if it were paper. I felt an unprecedented surge of adrenaline course through my body as I tried to come up with a plan to stop this gruesome slaughter. For God's sake, call for help. I desperately shouted. But as fate would have it, our cell phones had no service deep within that treacherous swampland. As the Ruguru sank its horrific fangs into yet another victim, the rest of us were gripped with terror, knowing full well that our options were running out fast. Even with my experience... Every beast I've crossed paths with in the past seemed almost tame compared to this nightmarish creature. The pain and fear etched on my companions' faces mirrored those grisly accounts, now becoming all too real and relatable in this dreadful moment. I quickly made a difficult choice, save us some precious time while we searched for help. But how? I could feel that dreaded sense of powerlessness creeping up on me and threatening to consume me whole as I watched my comrades being mangled helplessly by this monstrous cryptid. In that horrifying moment, I decided to use the only weapon I had, distraction. Hey, you ugly beast! I yelled at the top of my lungs. Over here! Try taking a bite out of someone who can actually fight back. The Ruguru, its matted fur slick with blood and ichor, turned its red-rimmed eyes toward me with fury. Guided by pure instinct, I wrenched a thick branch from a nearby tree and waved it menacingly. The creature hesitated for a second and then charged at me, its snarl an unnerving mix of animal ferocity and something much more sinister. Run! I screamed at the remaining members of our group. Get help! They sprinted away, their fear lending speed to their limbs. With a tense breath, I braced myself as the monstrous beast closed in on me. 
In one swift motion, I swung the branch with all my might, catching the rougarou in its misshapen jaw. It howled in pain and rage, stumbling back a few steps before regaining its footing. I knew I wouldn't be able to fend off this thing for long, but maybe every second counted if it gave my companions enough time to find someone who could help us escape this gruesome ordeal. As the beast lunged toward me again, another voice rang out through the night air. Stay back! It was an old Cajun man we had met earlier in town, Jacques, who had reluctantly agreed to guide us into the treacherous swamps. He stepped out from behind a towering cypress tree holding what looked like an ornate silver dagger dipped in some kind of pungent liquid he'd prepared earlier. Waving the dagger above his head like a man-man but with eyes that spelled experience and determination, Jacques stepped between me and the Rougarou. The creature halted mid-charge, seemingly unnerved by the Cajun's unwavering conviction. Listen to me, vile creature! Jacques shouted in a thick accent. You shall haunt this place no more. The silver of this blade has been blessed and the concoction it bears is a mixture of ancient salts and the most potent swamp herbs. Be gone or be slain. To my amazement, the Rougarou backed away, snarling but no longer attacking. Taking advantage of the reprieve, I cautiously retreated as shock held his ground. The creature warily eyed us before turning and disappearing into the oppressive darkness of the swamp. What? What just happened? I stammered, breathing heavily from the adrenaline-fueled encounter. Shock gave me a knowing smile, but said nothing as we began to make our way back to the safety of the town. It was clear that he knew more about this supernatural beast than any of us, but was keeping those secrets locked away. Instead of pressing him for answers... I focused on making sure we located the rest of our group and that everyone made it back safely. Our mangled comrades were transported to a small local clinic, where they would receive medical attention for their horrific injuries. As day broke over the bayou and the eerie fog lifted, I realized that my life had changed forever after that fateful night in Louisiana. The Rougarou remained at large, a horrifying reminder that there are unknown dangers lurking in the darkest corners of this world. Although I left that small town behind, it felt like a piece of me would always remain among those hallowed swamps, forever haunted by that gruesome night with an unforgettable epic monster. It all began with what seemed like an average afternoon in the heart of Vena National Park. As a Green Beret in the United States Army Special Forces, I've experienced my fair share of death and destruction. But, as we made our way deeper into the forest that day, nothing could have prepared me for the sinister events that were about to unfold. Our mission had been classified, so I couldn't speak much about it. However, what I could say was that our squad had set up camp near the banks of a narrow creek whose water gently flowed beside our tents. The perfect soundtrack to nature aside, we were still on edge because, at the end of the day, it was still a mission. Devin Cleophas, a bald chap in our unit who never went anywhere without his bowie knife, had just returned from foraging for berries when suddenly our team captain, Jessup Fine, raised his hand and motioned for us to halt. He'd heard something odd coming from the distance, a sort of snarling that didn't quite belong to any known animal native to these parts. A nerve-wracking silence settled over us as we listened intently, hanging on to every potential clue the whispers and the breeze could offer. I caught myself making mental notes of everyone's exact position, analyzing each person's face for any signs of fear or weakness. 
Only later would I realize how incredibly important those subtle expressions would be. With a meek whisper of permission from Fine, we cautiously advanced toward the sound. Along came another snarl, louder this time, and an air-splitting scream that sent chills down my spine. We quickened our pace and stumbled upon a bloody scene. A family of hikers lay strewn on the ground with their bodies brutally ripped apart. Though I am not squeamish by any stretch of the imagination, our field demanded indifference to blood. This massacre left me pale and shaken. Terrified and disgusted as I was, the investigator in me knew that this wasn't the work of a crazed monster. Instead, I racked my brains to make sense of the horror that spread before us. A distinct smell wafted towards us, a sickly combination of blood, decay, and something else I couldn't quite put my finger on. It was a scent so astonishingly powerful that even now, months later, it seared into my memory as a sickening reminder of that gruesome day. As we inspected the scene, Determined to track down the beast responsible, something caught my eye. There were strange markings just beyond the mutilated bodies, tracks leading further into the wilderness. Our eyes met in an instant, and we knew we had no choice but to pursue those prints and unveil the sinister secret lurking within this quiet forest. The sun dipped behind the horizon as shadows stretched out from the tree trunks wrapping us in an eerie cocoon of darkness. But despite their growing skepticism, there was no way our team could abandon this unsettling investigation. With each step deeper into the woods, laughter bubbled from Devin Cleofa's throat like a shot of liquid courage. His gallows humor masks our shared terror. If we're going down swinging... He joked while drawing his trusted knife in a wide arc through the air, then at least let it be glorious. But just as quickly as his words left his mouth, another guttural roar shattered any momentary comic relief we'd been offered. And so, with wide-knuckled fists gripping our weapons ever tighter and the swift thuds of our boots on damp moss echoing through the trees, we braced ourselves for whatever wicked fate awaited us around each shadowed bend. Our team sprinted through the forest as sweat dripped down our faces. The source of the guttural roar seemed to be just out of reach, infuriatingly mocking us. At 5.17 p.m., we stumbled across another crime scene, this one even more grotesque than the last. Bloodied entrails were strung up between trees like twisted party decorations, and the stench was suffocating. Among the gruesome display lay an intact lower jaw, human or animal, I couldn't tell. Jessup looked over our group with somber eyes and firmly commanded. We split into two groups. Group A will follow these tracks that are leading west. Group B. I want you to scout the east and check for any more traces of this creature. Meet back here in exactly one hour. Devin and I joined Group A, while Captain Fine led Group B. As we moved deeper into the woods, following the barely visible set of tracks, a thick fog began to set in. I couldn't help but feel a sense of foreboding as the visibility worsened. At 6.07 p.m., Devin found a clue we couldn't ignore. Fresh blood splattered near a cluster of ferns. My stomach clenched at the sight of it. We continued forward, gripped by fear and determination, until we reached a secluded cave around 6.29 p.m. Devin and I decided it was best if one of us went in first to assess the situation, while the others stood guard outside. I'll go, whispered Devin as he cautiously descended into the darkness. My heart pounded against my ribs in suspense. I felt like prey waiting for its fate to be sealed. Suddenly, an agonizing scream tore through the cave, followed by snarling growls that shook my very soul. 
A cacophony of sounds erupted. Gunshots fired and echoing roars enshrouded me. I raised my rifle and sprinted into the cave, teeth clenched and ready for a battle. The most horrifying sight I'd ever seen was inside, lit only by a weak shaft of light. The creature was monstrous and unnatural in every way. Standing on two legs like a twisted mockery of a man, it surged toward Devon with massive claws poised to deliver a fatal blow. The sinewy muscles holding its fur-covered body together were a patchwork of matted dirt. Putrid breath poured from its gaping maw filled with dagger-like teeth as its bloodshot eyes locked on to Devon. But what scared me the most was that despite its beast-like appearance, it wore torn military clothing, with metals dangling from its grisly form. Somewhere hidden within that creature was a man who'd once been just like us. In that split second, I fired my weapon at the creature without hesitation. The bullet struck its skull clean and true, and tarnished brain matter scattered onto the damp cave floor. However, it stood unfazed and let out an ear-splitting screech that sent me reeling back in terror. It glanced between Devon and me before crashing through the cave wall and disappearing into the murky forest beyond. We were both shaken to our cores, but we knew our pursuit was anything but over. It was clear now that we were facing something far more sinister than we'd ever imagined, an evil born not just from primal hunger but also from deep within the human psyche. The chaotic sounds of battle drew Captain Fine and Group B in a short while later. We exchanged glances, knowing fearfully well that wherever this beast may hide, we will not be the hunters. We are now the prey. I had always been proud of my Native American heritage, but living in modern society, I tended to forget the cultural stories that had been passed down in my family. However, one experience shook me to the core and made me remember that not everything can be explained by science. This all happened about a year ago, during one chilly winter night. I was driving back home after a long day at work when I first caught a glimpse of it. On the side of Highway 491, near Shiprock, New Mexico, there was something peculiar on the horizon. The way its silhouette moved was unnatural and unsettling, like a creature from another world. At that moment, I laughed it off as nothing more than an odd-looking tree caught in the strong winter wind as I approached my house on the edge of town. However, the discomfort from that encounter kept gnawing at my subconscious. As dusk fell over Shiprock, I decided to unwind with a little TV and try to put the incident behind me. That's when I heard it, a faint scratching sound coming from outside my window. I peered through the blinds and saw something similar to what I'd seen earlier while driving. My heart pounded against my chest as I grabbed my phone and dialed my best friend, Alex, who lived just around the corner. When he picked up after three nerve-wracking rings, his voice came out as sleepy slurs. Alex, I whispered hastily into the receiver. There's something outside my house right now. It's like a creature or something. Are you kidding? What does it look like? He asked tiredly but with a hint of curiosity. I can't exactly tell. I admitted in hushed tones. It's tall and covered in what looks like thick fur. Before Alex could reply, something sudden caused me to drop the phone. The creature outside began hurling rocks at my window. Shaking with fear, I listened to the sound of cracking glass and the hiss of wind seeping through the cracks. The creature was aggressive in its assault, and I started to panic. As I scrambled frantically to find a place to hide, I recalled the old legends passed down by my grandmother, 
stories about terrifying monsters that roamed the land and tormented tribes. My heart skipped a beat when I suddenly remembered a word that sounded eerily similar to what now approached my house. Skinwalker. I knew then that none of those stories were just legends. The creature outside was real, and it seemed truly intent on my demise. I scooped the phone off the floor and whispered urgently to Alex. You have to get over here right now. I don't know if this thing will break in. Be careful when driving. It might see you too. I'll bring my shotgun. He said with an unnerving calmness that shook my core more than any loud roar could. As Alex sped toward me, the creature pounded harder against the house's walls, causing items inside to rattle violently. I didn't know how long my hiding spot would keep me safe from this monstrous being. Losing all hope. I clenched my teeth and prayed for either a miracle or my inevitable doom. Hiding beneath my bed, I could hear the creature snarling and clawing against the walls. The sound of my shattered window was replaced with the thud of heavy footsteps getting closer. As it approached my bedroom, I held my breath, only daring to breathe when I heard its guttural growl and the sound of someone else's voice echoing through the room. Hey! Ugly! Over here! Alex shouted from the doorway, armed with his shotgun in hand. With that distraction, the creature immediately shifted its attention to him, baring its sharp teeth and screeching as it lunged in his direction. Alex fired a shot and hit the creature square in the chest, causing it to shriek and stumble back from the impact. It landed with a thud on my broken windowpane, which sliced its flesh even further. He then aimed at its head and fired again. The second shot echoed through the night, deafening me momentarily. The creature let out a final, distorted scream before collapsing onto what remained of my bedroom floor. Its body quivered as life began to flee from its form until finally falling limp. Dead or unconscious, I couldn't be sure. With sweat dripping from his forehead, Alex rushed over to help me out from under my bed. What the hell is that thing? I asked him shakily as adrenaline coursed through my veins. I'm not entirely sure. He admitted grimly as we both stared at the unmoving form of our attacker. But I've heard stories about skinwalkers from my uncle who lives on a nearby reservation. Our conversation was cut short by sirens blaring in the distance, most likely triggered by the sounds of gunshots in our quiet neighborhood. Unsure whether this creature would remain incapacitated for long or not, we resolved to wait outside for help to arrive. Through our frantic explanations, the police seemed skeptical but ultimately decided to pass the creature's remains along to local tribal members who had knowledge of such creatures and how to handle them. I overheard one officer mention that he'd encountered a similar case several years ago. With the help of the community and my renewed sense of friendship with those around me, I started to rebuild my life after that horrifying encounter with the creature colloquially known as a skinwalker. And though it may seem like an overall happy ending for me, there are times when I hear an odd growl in the wind or encounter frenzied animals in my yard. Those eerie moments force me to wonder if perhaps that skinwalker wasn't alone. After all, could there be more out there? And how long would it be until terror strikes again? The ever-looming uncertainty keeps me paranoid and alert, ready for whatever horrors may come next. I remember the first time I moved into that old apartment building on Main Street. It was quite an experience. The place had seen better days, but the rent was within my budget, and the location, in a historical part of town, was perfect. 
Little did I know that moving there would ultimately change my life forever. As a Native American, I've always been in touch with my roots and love nothing more than exploring those parts of the country with historical significance. This move seemed like it would provide an excellent opportunity to check out some ancient burial grounds, abandoned mines, and other such places. One evening, as I returned to my apartment building after work, I noticed a flyer advertising a local stand-up comedy show that weekend. I decided to go for it as a way to unwind from the stressful week. The comedians were pretty funny and had a knack for sharing relatable stories about everyday life. The following Tuesday, during a walk through town, I stumbled across an old library. Inside, among shelves packed with dusty tomes full of local history, fascinating tidbits caught my eye. Rumors of a mysterious creature said to have roamed through these parts since settlers first arrived. A couple of weeks passed by, and one evening I decided to visit a nearby bar with some locals I'd met. As we enjoyed our drinks and engaged in conversation, one of them brought up the peculiar story surrounding the creature that haunted this part of town for generations. Unable to obtain any concrete description or name for it, they shared strange stories passed down through families about this elusive creature with various dangerous abilities. As that cold month continued on into winter's grip and the days grew shorter, life took its usual course. However, incidents began happening around town. People disappeared without a trace or were found dead in strange circumstances, and local authorities were not only bewildered but overwhelmed. This inexplicable series of events became increasingly disturbing when, one morning, someone discovered what appeared to be the remains of a person in a neighboring alleyway. The body was almost unrecognizable, shredded and mutilated. While the police investigated and tried to keep everything under wraps, rumors began to spread about a sinister connection with that elusive creature spoken of in hushed whispers. I began conducting my investigation into the matter out of pure curiosity, using the library as my primary source of information not yet shared with law enforcement. My findings didn't give me any new insight but instead seemed to only add to confusion. Late one evening, after perusing the library for hours and finding clarity still beyond my reach, I decided to walk home through an unfamiliar shortcut. Turning down a narrow back street, an unshakable feeling of unease began crawling up my spine. The shadows felt more oppressive than they should have. As I quickened my steps, I became aware of heavy footfalls behind me. I glanced back and saw a figure standing at the end of the alley. It was tall, menacing, and shrouded in darkness as it towered over me. Its contours seemed unnatural, twisted and distorted as if they defied reality itself. Panic coursed through me as I raced forward, the footsteps echoing behind me growing closer and more insistent. The wind howled through the deserted streets like tortured souls begging for salvation. Suddenly, something emerged from the shadow directly in front of me, its eyes bright with menace, making my blood freeze within. I knew I had to do something, and fast. I scrambled up a fire escape, my heart pounding in my chest as the shadowy figure below gave chase. I went through every myth and folklore creature in my head, desperately trying to figure out what I was dealing with. Finally, it hit me. This creature resembled the Slender Man. I remembered hearing about him through some online forums where people claimed to see him stalking abandoned areas. As I reached the roof, I found an old metal pipe to use as a makeshift weapon, there was no time for fear. I needed to be proactive if I wanted to survive this encounter. Turning around, I saw the horrifying figure climbing up the fire escape after me. 
The slender man's long limbs took only moments to ascend the metal ladder. The moonlight illuminated his gaunt face, filled with malevolence and cruelty. He lunged towards me but narrowly missed as I swung the pipe at his unnatural limbs. He hissed in frustration and quickly recovered. Ignore it! Keep moving! I shouted to myself as I jumped from one rooftop to another, trying not to lose my footing in the process. A few times he managed to grab hold of me, but I fought him off with adrenaline-fueled strength. Eventually, after minutes that felt like an eternity, I found an open window and crawled through it onto a cluttered apartment floor. Gasping for breath and bleeding from scrapes and cuts on my arms and legs, I barricaded myself inside the room. Minutes passed by without any sign of the slender man crashing through with those hideous arms or even making a single sound outside the window. There was no time to relax. If he couldn't come in now, then he was most likely already plotting another attack elsewhere. I stumbled towards a computer station on the messy desk in the corner of the room, ignoring the throbbing pain in my limbs. Quickly, I typed out a warning message to an online forum where others had shared their encounters with the Slender Man. As the seconds turned into minutes, it became evident that perhaps he had decided to look for prey elsewhere. Though relieved, I couldn't shake the nagging fear that I was still not safe. Sirens echoed in the distance, the flashing lights of an approaching ambulance reflecting off the buildings as I heard frantic voices growing nearer. It appears that someone called emergency services after hearing my desperate struggle against the slender man. The uniformed responders broke through the barricaded door, finding me shaken but determined to expose this creature to a wider audience. They carted me off to a nearby hospital as I tried to recount my harrowing story. Three days later, discharged from the hospital and feeling somewhat recovered, I was contacted by another person claiming to have come across a similar encounter with the Slender Man. They thanked me for my warning message and offered insights from their own experiences. Together, we began forming a community of survivors bent on uncovering this mysterious entity and preventing it from harming anyone else. My life had irreversibly changed since that fateful night when I discovered that some things haunting our nightmares were real. Over time, sightings of the Slender Man continued to surface, leaving me and others like me on guard and prepared for another confrontation unsure if we would ever feel entirely safe again. In time, we knew other people might benefit from knowing what we encountered during those dark days, and more importantly, that they were not alone in their experiences. Our group expanded as we continued to search for answers and protect those who crossed paths with this evil being. But one thing remains clear, the danger is ever-present, lurking just beyond our sight. And while we never know when or where the Slender Man will strike again, we remain vigilant and committed to bringing this abomination to justice. We will never forget the dark creature who's been haunting our world, his grotesque shape looming in the shadows of our nightmares, waiting for the next moment to strike. It was one of those things that you don't expect to happen to you. It was straight out of a creepy story, except it wasn't fiction. Last June 27th, over a long weekend, my buddies and I decided to go on a hiking trip in the dense woods of Manistee National Forest in Michigan. My name is Zydrinus Chauncey, but most people just call me Z. As odd as my name is... I promise this story is even odder. The first day passed without incident. There was banter and laughter as we navigated winding trails and set up camp. Our group consisted of Clay Steinhauer, Parsival Kasperzik, 
Zoraida Benincourt, and myself. We didn't know each other's names until we got lost together in an unfamiliar town two summers ago, but that's a story for another time. On the second day of our hike, we stumbled upon something strange. Large prints scattered around that seemed like a mixture of animal and human tracks. The bizarre sight piqued our curiosity. Little did we know we were getting ourselves into something far darker than any curious footprint. Later that night, as we sat around the fire roasting marshmallows and sharing stories, there came an unsettling sound, breaking branches from somewhere in the dark woods around us. Clays grabbed his flashlight, while Parsival reached for his hunting knife, attempting to sound nonchalant but unable to hide the fear trickling into his voice. So Ryder whispered nervously, Do you guys think it's some sort of wild animal? As if on cue, another loud crunch echoed through the silence. We huddled together quietly intently listening for any signs that could tell us what was happening in the darkness surrounding us. Suddenly, and impossibly fast, there appeared before us an almost human figure with bone-chilling red eyes and sickly gray skin that stretched over its emaciated frame. It snarled cruelly, revealing sharp, mangled teeth that glistened against the dying firelight. I felt more terror than I've ever felt in my life as the thing lunged at us, grabbing Zoraida and ripping into her with inhuman strength. Blood sprayed everywhere while we screamed and tried to fight off the beast. It was pure pandemonium as Zoraida's limp body fell to the ground in a heap of crimson and gore. We didn't have time to process what had just happened. Our survival instincts took over, and we ran. The creature's deafening howls sent shivers down my spine as we fled for our lives, with Parsival trailing just behind me, both of us in a panic sprint. But no matter how fast we ran or how far away we thought we'd gotten from it, the creature kept pace with a relentless determination that verged on predatory malice. And then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, it was gone, vanished back into the shadows as if it had never been there at all. Parsival and I finally crumpled to the ground in exhaustion, our breaths coming out in ragged gasps. We managed to make our way back to camp, where Clay's crouched over Zoraida's mangled body, his eyes filled with tears and terror etched across his pale face. I'll never forget the sense of chilling dread that gripped us as we left the campsite that night, our hearts pounding violently in our chests, and fleeting glances cast back over our shoulders into the treacherous darkness enveloping us. To this day, Parsival doesn't speak much about that night, opting instead for quiet brooding and an unspoken vow never to return to Manistee National Forest. Several days later, I found out through whispered rumors that the creature we encountered was known as a skinwalker, a terrifying entity with roots deep within the folklore of the area. But instead of providing comfort and closure, this new information only served to poke at fresh wounds and reinforce just how close we came to our own doom. As I sit here now, clutching an old newspaper article about the grisly scene we left behind, I can't shake the feeling that on some moonless night in the near future, I'll look up into the darkness and see those blood-red eyes staring back at me once more. As I stared at the blood-stained newspaper clippings in my trembling hands, I knew I had to face this nightmare. I wasn't ready to just go on living in a constant state of fear. But how could three ordinary guys like us hope to take down a supernatural creature like the Skinwalker? The legends about Skinwalkers made it clear that conventional weapons were useless against them. So, we sought help from a local Native American shaman who had knowledge of such things. The shaman was an old man with piercing gray eyes and long, silvery hair that hung down to his waist. 
He listened intently as we recounted our horrific encounter in Manistee National Forest. A somber expression washed over his face, and he told us in no uncertain terms that the skinwalker was not something we should trifle with. However, he agreed to help us when he sensed our unwavering determination. The shaman performed a ritual to cleanse us from the evil energy and gave us each a woven amulet infused with sage and protective energies. While these wouldn't be enough to defeat the creature, they would at least provide some defense against its magic. For our offense, the shaman recommended weapons made of pure silver, the only material thought to harm the beast. Over several cautiously planned weeks, my friends Clay's Parsival and I prepared ourselves physically and emotionally for our confrontation with the monster. We obtained pure silver knives that were said to be sharper and more durable than anything else we could find. As D-Day finally arrived and we set out into Manistee National Forest, we carried more than just those gleaming silver blades. We carried our determination to end this nightmare once and for all. We returned on June 27th at exactly 11.05 p.m., one year since our initial encounter, to where it all started. According to what little information we could gather about the skinwalker, it was most likely to return around the same time and place it first attacked. The air was thick with apprehension as we nervously glanced around in the shadows for any signs of our adversary. Then, just past midnight, a guttural growl came from the thicket nearby. Hearts pounding in our chests, Clay's Parsival, and I readied our silver knives and braced ourselves for the imminent attack. Suddenly it appeared as if from thin air. The monster had returned, with twisted gray skin pulled tight over its skeletal frame and those haunting red eyes that seared into our souls. With a roar that shook the very earth beneath us, it charged at us. We each dodged to different sides, with clays slashing wildly at the creature as Park, meanwhile, sneaked up behind it to start stabbing vigorously at its legs. Blood splattered across my face as the monster writhed in agony. Turns out Silver really was effective against this creature. Using every ounce of strength I could muster, I lunged toward its back and drove my knife deep inside its fetid flesh. The creature screamed in pain and collapsed to the ground, thrashing madly in a desperate attempt to dislodge us. But we didn't let up. We continued sinking our silver knives into its body, over and over again, until finally, silence. With wide-eyed disbelief, we stared at the lifeless body of the skinwalker before us grotesque limbs bent unnaturally and a nauseating amount of blood pooling beneath it. It may not have been an idealistic solution, but it nevertheless satisfied our hatred and fear towards that vile entity. Seething questions regarding its origin hovered heavily above us as we departed from Manistee National Forest's haunted grounds. Bidding our farewells to Zoraida's unmarked grave, we vowed never to return after having avenged her gruesome death. Over time, we kept our vow and moved on with our lives, always grateful for the shaman's assistance and honoring Zoraida's memory. I am eternally cautious now, more than willing to heed warnings about unexplained creatures that supposedly lurk beyond our understanding. Although turbulent emotions may still sporadically rattle my core, I take solace in knowing those blood-red eyes will never set their sights on me again. It was a particularly dark day back on June 3rd, 2016, that stands out to me. Something about it felt overwhelmingly ominous. It was one of those days when you couldn't quite put your finger on what was wrong, but something didn't sit right in the pit of your stomach. I am Carlton Gaines, 
a now-retired United States soldier who went through experiences most people won't have in their lifetimes. My last mission before retirement was one that would haunt me for the rest of my life. My team and I were sent to conduct a secret mission in Chernobyl, Ukraine. We were there with the rather vague purpose of investigating an alarming increase in violent incidents in this deserted area surrounding the No. 4 reactor, including the deaths and mutilations of some unfortunate souls who dared to venture into its confines. In truth, we didn't know much more than that. The military briefing stressed urgency but offered little additional information. On arrival at our undisclosed base camp in Chernobyl, we met up with local Ukrainian military personnel assigned to assist us on our mission. Among them was a young officer named Kuzma Sobchak, who would play an integral part in what unfolded. Things started relatively slowly. Scouting expeditions led by Kuzma took us to various sites around the exclusion zone, aiding us each day with our investigation. Then came June 12, when we discovered something that would forever change our perspective on what lurked around the abandoned territory. Kuzma received intelligence about an unusually mutilated body found in Pripyat, just within the city limits. The disturbing discovery took us by surprise, as we had scoured this area only a day before and found nothing. Upon reaching the scene and carefully examining the remains, it became clear this was no ordinary mutilation. Tissue had been torn apart as though attacked by some monstrous beast rather than any human instrument. Large bite marks and claw-like gashes defied any conventional explanation. Confronting this grotesque sight, the thought of a mutated creature born of the radiation that blanketed Chernobyl after the nuclear disaster crossed our minds, but was immediately dismissed as fanciful conjecture. After all, we were level-headed soldiers trained to search for logical explanations and not let our imaginations run wild. That was until the next unsettling incident. On June 16th, as we continued with our expeditions, we came across a trail of destruction along the outskirts near Duga 1. Vegetation trampled underfoot or torn to shreds led us to yet another horrific scene. This time, there were multiple victims, two Ukrainian soldiers and an unfortunate group of illegal tourists who had trespassed into the zone. They, too, bore destruction-wrought evidence of savagery that resembled the previous mutilation we had seen in Pripyat. An unsettling air filled the atmosphere. Something was clearly hunting humans. Utilizing every resource at our disposal and working desperately into the night, we searched tirelessly for answers and explanations as to what could possibly be causing this mayhem. It wasn't until one fateful evening when Kuzma received a phone call that we found a glimmer of revelation. Kuzma took me aside and explained that his cousin, once an animal keeper in Pripyat before the disaster, revealed that some animals managed to survive the nuclear fallout. These creatures adapted beyond anything anyone could have imagined. The descriptions given seemed too surreal to be taken seriously. A mutated bear, wolf, or even dog hybrid with ferocious strength and size but they undeniably matched parts of our terrifying discoveries over these past weeks. The prospect felt ludicrous but offered more semblance of an explanation than any other theory. We were dealing with a monstrosity born of human folly. Before we could embark on our new line of investigation, we were abruptly recalled back to base camp on June 18th. The military command had decided we had ventured too far and gathered enough information for our mission. As we prepared to leave, chaos unfolded around us. A distant scream tore through the night's silence, followed by an inhuman snarling sound. What followed remains unclear as everything was plunged into a whirlwind of disarray. Gunfire rained through the air, soldiers screaming 
and a gargantuan shadow darted behind buildings with menacing growls. In the throes of this nightmare, our window to evacuate was closing rapidly. Panic clawed at our throats, and adrenaline fueled our escape through the chaotic pandemonium that had descended upon our base camp. As we scrambled for the safety of our transport helicopters, Kuzma and I shared one last look, a shared understanding of the terrifying reality we would carry with us forever. In the days that followed, I learned more about this monstrous creature we encountered in Chernobyl. On June 19th, while debriefing with my superiors, I shared a detailed account of everything we experienced, as well as the troubling information given by Kuzma's cousin. It turns out the mutated creature was a hybrid of various animals that had been exposed to radiation for years. It stood about eight feet tall with muscular arms and legs, densely covered in coarse fur, seemingly black in color but covered with gray patches. Its massive head resembled a bear or wolf with razor-sharp fangs and its claws seemed unnaturally long and dangerous. On June 23rd, following a thorough investigation, official reports stated that one single predator was behind all of these cruel acts. The seeds of dread sown into our psyche came to fruition as the antagonist had been identified. Kuzma's cousin's theory held water, but still, Nobody dared to venture close enough to confirm its appearance beyond any doubt. Our terrifying ordeal finally culminated on June 25th when I received a call from Kuzma himself. He informed me that the brass back at Chernobyl decided to bring in heavy artillery after some locals began spreading rumors about this monstrous creature potentially returning for more bloodshed. I could hear the weariness in his voice as he recounted the gruesome aftermath they discovered once they dared to approach what remained of our former base camp. Limbs were strewn haphazardly around, casualties caught in a lethal dance between human predators attempting to protect their territory and an indomitable beast determined to claim it for itself. Despite their ferocious firepower, the soldiers' onslaught couldn't bring down the terrifying horror that haunted Chernobyl. The creature seemed to dissolve into the night air, evading capture and leaving everyone wondering if it would ever truly be defeated. They carried out a final sweep of the area, trying to ensure no other bloodthirsty monsters roamed freely in the contaminated wasteland. It has now been almost one month since our harrowing ordeal in Chernobyl, and while the nightmare continues to haunt both Kuzma and me, we know that returning there would be catastrophic. Unable to be captured or killed, the antagonist of our twisted story remains to lurk in the shadows, an enduring reminder of humanity's darkest creation. Even now, as I sit here retelling my story with sweaty palms and shaky hands, I still fear the unknown lurking in Chernobyl's foreboding darkness. I continue to question how many more miserable souls might fall victim to this monstrous mutation spawned from nuclear negligence. In retrospect, these haunting questions continue echoing through my mind louder than any bone-chilling snarl could ever hope to. However, wrapping my mind around their eldritch implications is simply unimaginable. Therefore, I choose instead to endure living with chilling questions for which I don't have answers, a painful alternative that keeps my sanity intact for now. As for the abomination that left us shuddering with fear during those horrifying nights in Chernobyl, well, let's just say that some horrors are better left buried amongst trembling whispers and cautious glances from the corner of our eyes. The scars this monster left on our souls serve as steadfast reminders of just how thin the fragile line between life and unspeakable terror truly is. On December 5, 2006, around 9.30 p.m., I found myself on the desolate outskirts of Albuquerque, 
New Mexico. The somewhat unkempt parking lot of an old gas station slash convenience store served as the endpoint to yet another monotonous stretch of road on my otherwise routine job as a CIA operator. But that night, something peculiar would occur that I'd never forget for as long as I lived. My name is Lysander Finnegan. I've seen a lot of odd things on these roads over the years but what happened that night truly defies reason. Stopping there for a quick rest and fuel top-off seemed simple enough at first. The cashier, a scrawny lad with fading tattoos and a handlebar mustache, cracked a rather unsavory joke about my rental car's shabby state. We exchanged a few words otherwise. Zipping up my jacket after exiting the store, I decided to answer nature's call on the far side of the building before departing. What could be easier? But as soon as my boots hit the gravel behind the building, I heard it, faint scratching sounds that seemed to come from just beyond a small cluster of nearby bushes. Being paranoid as hell from years on, this job had its perks. My hand instinctively reached for my Glock 19 tucked beneath my jacket. The wind brushing against the bushes further heightened my suspicions that something wasn't right with this situation. After hearing what sounded like a once-human cry of agony, my legs forced me toward the noises to investigate. As I cautiously rounded the corner, my eyes fell upon an old man, or what used to be one. He lay crumpled against a peeling brick wall, his limbs twisted at unnatural angles, and his throat ripped open as if savagely assaulted by some mad beast. The smell was unbearable, yet curiously fresh. The hair on the back of my neck prickled, and my gut told me that I was no longer alone. Sensing a sudden movement behind me, I turned to discover a grotesque figure emerging from the darkness. Its eyes glinted red in the dim glow of the gas station's flickering neon lights. Its bodily form oozed like molten shadows, draped in a cloak of living darkness. Long claws extended from its bony hands, dripping with a dark, viscous fluid that stained the gravel below. It looked neither human nor animal and seemed like one of those urban legends you hear late at night when you can't fall asleep. Gripping my gun tighter and steadying my breath, I fired off three warning shots into the air. But the creature didn't back down. Instead, it launched itself upon an unsuspecting passerby who had just exited the gas station. He didn't stand a chance. That was when I made the split-second decision to take matters into my own hands. Engaging in a cat-and-mouse game with this horrific being around the old gas station lot seemed almost idiotic, but running away wasn't an option. So there I was, in pursuit of something no one but me had seen, trying to make sense of what was happening and hoping fervently that backup would soon arrive. Its movements were fast and unpredictable, darting through a maze of gloomy corners and locked storage sheds, giving me restless pursuit as my heart pounded within my chest. Suddenly, it lunged from behind an abandoned trailer to attack me, perhaps thinking I'd let my guard down for just one moment. As it charged towards me, I managed to fire off several shots into its writhing form and watched as its twisted body collapsed onto the gravel before disappearing into a cloud of acrid black smoke. Just then, I saw a flash of blue and red swirling lights enter the gas station's parking lot. A cop car had arrived, just in time to witness the aftermath of my encounter with this nightmarish creature. The officer emerged from the vehicle, gun at the ready, and immediately started firing in the direction of where the creature had vanished. Stay back! I shouted at him, but he apparently didn't hear me over the sound of his own gunfire. Suddenly, the creature reappeared behind the officer, 
snarling and clawing at the air with its blood-drenched talons. The officer turned slowly, eyes wide in terror, as he finally grasped how real this monster was. Screw this! He mumbled to himself, abandoning his gun in a panic and dashing toward the cover of his squad car. By now, more people had exited the gas station and were gathering around, snapping photos with their phones, or simply screaming in horror at what they were witnessing. I wished they would all run away before this thing could hurt them, but I knew it was up to me to stop this nightmare once and for all. What do you want? I yelled at the creature. It tilted its head as if it were examining me, and for a moment, it almost looked human, until it opened its mouth wide and roared with an unearthly power that sent shivers through my entire being. I am hungry! It growled in fragmented croaks, as if communicating with us mortals was not a part of its nature. By then, more officers had arrived on scene, guns drawn but hesitant to fire after seeing how futile their attempts had been just moments before. I racked my brain for any knowledge I'd come across that could help defuse this situation without any further casualties. Anything that might drive this creature away without inviting disaster or death on us all. And then it hit me. I remembered an obscure article about ancient tribal rituals to ward off evil creatures, and I reckoned it was worth a shot. Let me give you what you want, I said to the creature as confidently and amiably as possible. I'll bring you food, whatever you desire. But in return, you have to leave this place and never harm anyone ever again. A guttural growl was the only reply I received. While everyone watched warily, I dashed into the gas station store and grabbed everything that looked remotely edible. Cold sandwiches, processed meat slices, bags of chips, and even a few cans of pet food for good measure. It wasn't fresh or pretty but perhaps that didn't matter to an otherworldly beast. I returned to the scene, presenting the odd assortment of food and placing it on the ground. Here, I said, gesturing towards the pile. The creature glanced at my offering, then back at me. While its grotesque form reeked of pure malice, its eyes seemed at least momentarily satisfied by what I had laid out before them. Before we could react... The creature lunged towards the food and began consuming it with frightening speed, completely ignoring us as if we didn't matter anymore. As soon as it had devoured the last bite of junk food, its eyes flickered red one last time and dissipated into thin air like fog at daybreak. In his terror-stricken state, one of the police officers, gasping for breath, mumbled, What in God's name was that thing? I sighed as I looked around at the remaining stacks of broken boxes and spilled food from my frantic search in the store before replying. Frankly, I have no idea. As we all stood there gathering our wits and replaying the unimaginable scene over and over in our minds, two thoughts slammed into me like a sledgehammer. I had just saved a gas station full of ordinary people. And how could I begin to explain such a bizarre tale that even I couldn't comprehend? As rain began to gently drizzle down on the flickering neon lights of the abandoned lot, we knew that a terrifying urban legend had been born, and its consequences would forever shroud the little gas station at the edge of town in an eerie veil of dark mystery.